I'm Alice, a teenage girl who always dreamed of finding true love. Several months ago, after a lot of failed hope, time, and effort, I started online dating and found my first ever boyfriend. We had a sweet, romantic online love story until we decided to meet in real life. So I'll take you back to the beginning. I would not be impatient that much when it came to love if both my besties, Kimmy and Zara, didn't get boyfriends, which made me become the only loner of the group. I had to watch them being all lovey-dovey and calling each other weird names like Baby Boo and Cuddly Bear. Yuck! Even if the boys weren't around, they would still drive me crazy talking about their sweet guys all the time. Worse still, when I told them to stop being so obsessed, they immediately insisted on pestering me to find a boyfriend. Ridiculous! I didn't need a boyfriend. I was doing just fine without one. Yeah, right. Who was I trying to kid? Deep down inside, I really wanted somebody by my side who I could be all cringy and lovey-dovey with. My two besties could probably read my mind and took action, and they set up some dates for me. The first was with this boy from school. He looked pretty cute on our first date, and he took me to this nice restaurant. A good start, isn't it? However, he talked about his mother for literally the entire time. Everything in sight reminded him of her, her favorite foods, how perfectly she made her spaghetti sauce, how politely she would react on the table. In the end, I suggested he go and date his mother instead, as he was clearly obsessed with her. Yeah, that didn't go down well. The next date was with this college boy. I fantasized a million times about a romantic, cozy, and sweet date with him because, you know, it was the middle of winter. But no, he turned up late, and when I asked him where we were going, he shrugged and said, wherever. By this point, I was freezing and hungry, so I suggested we go get something to eat. But he told me he had no money and would just watch me eat. I offered to buy him a drink so we could at least sit inside somewhere, but he refused. So, we ended up sitting in silence on a bench in the park. I ended up slurping on my hot chocolate just for entertainment. When I got home, I felt super sorry for myself. I was so tired of meetings and wasting time on those idiots. There must be an easier, more possible, and warmer way to find one. So, I downloaded a dating app. I'm not a complete idiot. I know that internet dating is risky, so I didn't post any pics of my face, just a landscape picture with a movie quote written on it, and I used a different name, Daisy. The matches started coming in, but it wasn't hard to weed out the fakes. There was even a man using a fake account to try and find out if his daughter was using it. Delete, delete, delete. I was about to give up and accept that I'd be single and alone forever. This online world was exactly like what I'd read about it. All lies. I'd just have to get some cats or something for company. But then, this guy messaged me saying he liked the movie quotes I used. Impressive. So I messaged him back. I found out that this Roger guy had the same movie taste as me, and he even lived in the same neighborhood. We got on so well, so we chatted way past midnight. It seemed like we had everything in common, from favorite pizza toppings to top celebrities. He even shared his love of electronic dance music. And once I tried hearing his recommended playlist, I was immediately completely hooked on it. Wow, this guy seemed interesting. So I decided to flirt it up and see if he had a sense of humor. I mean, I had to create opportunities for myself, right? So I wrote, Hey Roger, I enjoy chatting with you. Do you know what I would do if I could change the alphabet? He replied, No, what would you do? I would put you and I together so I could talk to you more. Then he sent me lots of heart icons and said, You're so funny. Actually, you don't need to change the alphabet because I also desire to know if there's any other way for me to talk to you. Chatting to this boy had cheered me up, so I sent him my Facebook link. I stayed cautious, so I sent him my clone account, which I sometimes used for sharing cool posts and commenting on pages. Moments later, I got a friend request from Roger. I checked his wall and found out a little more info about him, such as he went to the same high school as me two years ago and he played soccer because there were some field photos. There were no pictures of his face, but that was fine. Those real life photos could tell me more about him. The thought of having a cute, sporty boyfriend really made me excited. 
I smiled as I walked out of my room to go to the bathroom. Then I bumped into my older brother, Sam. Get out of my way, potato head. He taunted me as usual, but he had this weird grin on his face. Why are you so happy? I asked him. Never mind, he replied, while whistling and walking off. Had this weirdo just stuck some stupid note on my back? But, well, I was in a great mood and wouldn't let this childish bro bother me. I couldn't wait until morning to tell Kimmy and Zara about Roger. They were so excited and said the way I'd found him was like something out of a movie. They kept imagining how our new love story would be, and I had to admit that I began to daydream too. Roger and I messaged each other every night. He was always a great listener, and I could confide in him without feeling shy or anything. It wasn't long before he was always on my mind. I also sent random pictures to him throughout the day of my alien doodles, my shoes, my lunch, and so on. I even got a detention in math class for daydreaming about him. Oh wait, was I in love? I wondered if he felt the same about me. And the fateful day arrived. He sent me a message that both excited and terrified me. He wanted to hear my voice. Okay, so this meant he wanted to voice call or video call. What if he thought I sounded too squeaky? Or what if he thought I was ugly? So I decided to only open the camera when I turned off my room lights. Ironically, Roger did the same. He said he had to pretend like he was sleeping so that his sister wouldn't come in and interrupt our convo. Aw, he must be a sweet big brother whom his little girl could always count on. So, yeah, now we'd upgraded from texting to video calls. My feelings for him increased a bit more every day. He always sensed my mood and cheered me up, regardless of how lame my problem seemed. One time, I was annoyed because my parents told me off for forgetting to do my chores. It was not that big a deal. I cried to him on the phone, and he told me it was okay, and that his sister always forgot to do her chores too. So sometimes, he had to help her. God, he was so nice. Roger's sister was so lucky to have a big brother like him. Unlike my brother, who always sat back and sniggered whenever I got in trouble. Comparing them made me feel self-pity and cry even harder, until a point that he frantically blurted out, Listen, Daisy, I like you. Don't cry, because it hurts me so bad that I can't be there for you. I just want to meet you as soon as possible. Oh my god, was he serious? Did this mean he was asking me to be his girlfriend? At first, I was thrilled, but right after that, I started to worry. What if he didn't like the way I looked? Besides, when he'd found out I'd used a clone account to talk to him, would he be angry with me? I needed advice, so I turned to my besties. They told me to go and meet him, as this way, I'd know if he was serious about me or not. If he liked the real me, he would hear me out, without getting mad. I arranged to meet Roger in the park, and we both agreed to both wear something red for easy recognition. So I went for a red dress and red headband combo. Cute! I checked my phone a zillion times to make sure he hadn't cancelled. I also prepared as best I could by practicing my smile in the mirror and by doing a last minute nail polish change up. Yeah, I know, I was a slave to love. Ugh, I hated lovey-dovey couples, but look at me now! We arranged to meet by the flower garden in the park, the perfect location for a daisy. On the way, I had mixed feelings. I was both excited about seeing my online boyfriend for the first time and also worried. I mean, what if he didn't like me? As I arrived, I saw the back of a guy who was wearing a red hoodie. That must be him. Um, what should I do now? Okay, so I took a deep breath, then walked up behind him and timidly said, Um, hi Roger, is that you? He turned around, and to my shock, I saw that it was Sam, my dearest brother. Alice? What are you doing here? He asked. What? I'm here to meet my online boyfriend. What about you? I raised an eyebrow. Me too. I mean, I'm meeting a girl. My girlfriend, Daisy. He flustered out. Uh, are you? R Roger? I spluttered out and ended up biting my tongue in the process. Ouch. There was this awkward silence as we both stood there letting the awful truth soak in. 
Ugh. I swear, it was weird to think back on our messages and talking before. I got goosebumps at the thought of my brother's sweet words earlier. I couldn't take this anymore, so I muttered out something about going home and walked off. But I wasn't paying attention and walked straight into the flower garden and ended up trampling on the flowers, which received disapproving tuts from an onlooker. Oops, I couldn't really go home. It was way too embarrassing. So I wandered aimlessly around the park. Can you guys imagine it? The boy that had filled my dreams for the last two months turned out to be my brother. Now I knew why we had so many things in common. Because we were siblings. It started getting dark, but I was still in the park, sitting on a bench and wondering when my life turned into such a mess. Then Sam messaged me saying, Where are you? Come back home. I replied, no way! I don't want to see your face ever again! He replied, That's not what you said earlier. Trust him to make a joke out of this, but nothing about this situation was funny! Ugh! I replied, This is all your fault. I'm never coming home. Ever! Then he messaged back, Stop being overdramatic. I told mom you went to Kimmy's. Come home for dinner now. I didn't want to go home, but it was freezing out here and I guess I was feeling hungry. Why could Sam be all warm and well-fed while I was cold and miserable? I arrived home to see Sam sitting at the dinner table. I tried my best to avoid eye contact with him, but I ended up turning into a clumsy oaf and dropped a forkful of pasta on my lap. That was so gonna stain. Sam stood up and brought me a tissue box, which made me feel way more awkward. My parents must have found it odd that Sam and me weren't arguing for once. So mom said, you two seem to love each other for once, huh? She was just joking, but I could feel my face turning red. I glanced at my brother, and he seemed even more embarrassed than me. As awkward as it was, we needed to talk to clear the air. So after dinner, I messaged him to meet me outside, and we went for a walk. Finally, I broke the silence. Listen, I know this is the most awkward thing ever. I thought I loved Roger, but... Now that I know he's you, well, I don't feel the same anymore. He replied, Yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I agree with you on the feelings and stuff. I mean, you're my annoying sister. Who knew we had so much in common? But I guess it makes sense, as I taught you all the cool stuff you know. He grinned. So, are we cool? I looked at him. Yeah, we're cool, Potato Head. He grinned as he knocked my head and then in a taunting voice added, Hey, what do you think you were doing going online to find a boyfriend? You could have met a serial killer. I grimaced. You online dated too, and instead of a serial killer, I have met a guy who pretends to be a cool big brother, huh? It wasn't all lies. I do help you with your chores, or else you must get kicked out of our house for your laziness. He laughed. Sorry, bro, I've never seen that. You should do it more often. I sneered as I play hit his arm. We both looked at each other and then burst out laughing. So this is my story. Pretty awkward, huh? Thankfully, my brother and I are now back to normal. Ovs, neither of us have mentioned it to each other since. As for true love, well, I hope my time will come, but I'm in no hurry to go looking for it. Online dating is not for me. I have to admit, it is kind of funny thinking back on it. I mean, if one day in the future my children ask me about my first love, would I have to answer them, it was your Uncle Sam? Um, yeah. I don't think I'll be telling them that. Who put those books on the upper shelf? And why were my clothes in the closet reorganized? Did she seriously go into my room and rearrange my stuff? Unbelievable! Avery, dinner's ready. Okay, Dad, wait a sec. My dad shouted back. What's taking you so long? Come down now. Dinner is getting cold. Ugh, okay, I'm coming. As I walked into the kitchen, I gave her a resentful look. What were you doing? You know dinner's always at six. 
Well, that's because she went into my room and reorganized everything. It was like Hurricane Katrina stopped by my room. I had to put everything back where it was. You must be wondering why I had this attitude towards my mom. Well, first, she isn't my mom. She's my stepmom. And second, I just couldn't stand her. You see, my parents divorced when I was 15. And after just six months, my dad started dating Rose. My first impressions weren't great. I mean, look at her. Okay, she's kind of beautiful, but her style just doesn't fit her age. She has this whole wannabe rocker thing going on. No, I'm serious. She even has a tank top that says, I'm a rocker mom. My actual mom was the total opposite of Rose. She looks how a mom's meant to, with her elegant clothes and polite demeanor. And that's also how she raised me to be. Then there's the age difference. Rose is a decade younger than dad. Suspicious? What if she was only after his money? I thought they wouldn't last. But then one year later, they announced that they were getting married. So, yeah, you can see where my hate was coming from. That's enough of me telling you about my family. Let's go back to this boring dinner. My dad just gently said, Rose was just helping you. She didn't mean it. Now let's dig in. This smells delicious, honey. Ugh, whatever. I rolled my eyes and sat at the table. I looked down and couldn't believe my eyes. It was spinach and sausage lasagna, mom's signature dish. How dare Rose copy it? First, she rearranged my room, and now she wanted to replace my mom? Talk about a real-life evil stepmom. No way I was going to eat that. So I stood up, said I wasn't hungry, and started walking off. Dad stood up and was about to yell at me, but Rose stopped him. Whatever. I still ran upstairs and slammed my door shut. The next day, when I came home from school, I saw that Rose had a few friends over for beer and pizza in the living room. Look at them. They looked like they were having a band meeting. Normally, women their age have tea parties, not fast food fests. Hey, Avery. Rose greeted me. I just ignored her and went upstairs. But suddenly, I heard one of her friends say, What a stubborn kid. Doesn't she have manners? If I were you, I would show the kid who's the boss around here. Jesus. Her friends were awful just like her. Whatever, I didn't care what they said. But then Rose replied, Hey, don't talk about her like that. Avery's a lovely girl. She's just had a lot going on the past two years. Every child would behave the same after their parents' divorce, don't they? She just needs a little time adjusting. Oh, wow. I didn't expect those words coming from Rose. She actually stood up for me? Maybe, just maybe. I've misjudged her. Maybe I should try and give her a fairer chance? So that evening, when I saw her watching a movie, I walked over with a big bowl of popcorn and asked if I could join her. Rose looked shocked, like she'd seen a ghost or something. Then she gave me a big smile and said, Of course, I would really love that. I sat down next to her, and we watched Mad Max together. Oh, wow. There was a lot of violence and some weird-looking characters. Normally, I don't watch these kinds of films. I'm more of a rom-coms girl. But that movie was really, um, interesting. We talked during it, and I must say Rose is actually kinda cool. We were both laughing when I heard someone coughing behind me. I turned around to see my mom standing there with a frown on her face. Avery? Why didn't you return my calls and messages? Oh, I haven't introduced my mom to you yet. This is my beautiful mom, Melanie. She's a kind, gentle, elegant woman, and also a bit disciplined. But that's okay. I still love my mom very much. Mom? What are you doing here? I called you a dozen times, but you didn't answer. Clearly, you're preoccupied. I got worried, so I swung by to check on you. Oh, sorry, Mom. Rose and I were having so much fun that I didn't notice my phone. My mom knitted her brows and asked, Are we still on for shopping tomorrow? You need a new outfit for the debate contest, right? Yeah, of course. I will meet you at the mall after school. Oh, 
You two are going shopping? That's so cool. Can I join? At that moment, I thought, what a great idea. I mean, so far, they seem to get along okay. But what I didn't know was that a war between my mom and my stepmom had just launched. Rose gave me an excited smile. But mom, on the other hand, didn't look so thrilled. Maybe she was still mad that I missed her calls? So the next day after school, I went outside and saw my mom standing by her car. Oh, was she waiting for me? I was about to walk toward her when I suddenly noticed she was giving dirty looks to someone. Oh my god, Rose was waiting on the other side of the street. I quickly jumped behind some bushes to hide from them. Don't tell me the two were here to pick me up. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was mom. There's no way I was deciding between them, so I told her I was already on my way to the mall. Ugh. Now, let's talk about my fun family day out at the mall. Hmm. It was a disaster. My mom and Rose have very different style, ofs, so my mom chose this elegant black vest and skirt for me, but Rose thought I looked like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> no offense, she's a badass who brought justice to women, but Rose was kinda right. That outfit just didn't work for me. Then Rose chose this red dress for me. But, oh man, that's kind of revealing. They were constantly dragging me from this shop to the other like they were playing tug of war. And I was the freaking rope. I couldn't handle it anymore. Therefore, I just chose any dress so they'd stop throwing clothes in my face. On the way out of the mall, we passed a piercing shop. I've been wanting a helix piercing at the upper cartilage of my ear. They look so cool. I asked mom, but she profusely refused. Her own words were, it would make you look rebellious. His mom was still strict as always. Nonsense. Rose snorted. Melanie, Avery's old enough to make her own decisions. If she wants a piercing, then let her. Then she turned to me and said, come, I will take you inside. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. I glanced at mom, and she looked like she was about to explode with anger. But Rose had a point. I'm already 16 for crying out loud. After 15 minutes, Rose and I came out. Oh, thank God. Did you reconsider getting that ear piercing? Oh, yeah. Rose said that a nose piercing would suit me better. What? Uh-oh. Maybe the nose piercing wasn't such a good idea, because the tension between them was now catastrophic. Hmm, I needed a way to bring them together. So I came up with a brilliant plan. I arranged a holiday in Brazil for us all. I have a friend there, Pedro. He was an exchange student at my school, so he could show us around. Dad was in on the plan. At the last minute, he pretended to be busy and canceled his spot. Perfect. Now Rose and Mom would have plenty of bonding time. As soon as we walked into the hotel lobby, they started fighting over who got to share a room with me. What's wrong with them? We just landed in Brazil. So I took the keys from the receptionist and told them they were sharing, because I'll be by myself. <laughs> then in the evening, after we all got some rest, I waited for them in the lobby. Man, what's taking them so long? Suddenly, I saw two women walking over, and they were pushing each other. My God. It was Rose and Mom. I tried to keep calm and said, Jesus, can you two please stop acting like kindergarten kids? Mom sneered. Well, Rose over here took a 45-minute shower while I urgently needed to use the bathroom. You know how sensitive my stomach is. Rose rolled her eyes. That's because I have a strict beauty routine to follow. At least you got some sleep. I didn't, thanks to your bulldozer snoring. I certainly did not. Then they began to stare off like two UFC fighters. I shouted, Enough already! Listen up! I just made a dinner reservation for you two to get to know each other better. I have plans with Pedro, so I'll catch you both later. They were about to refuse, but I gave them this really intense look. Well, at least you're having fun. You two should hit a bar. Nothing can top some Brazilian bars. No drinking, and be back by 10 p.m. tops. Yeah, yeah, I know. Have fun. 
I waved at them and left the hotel. The next morning, I saw them talking to each other. Actually talking, not bickering. So I walked over to them and asked, Well, how was dinner? Then they told me it was actually really great. They were able to put their differences aside and got along. Success! <laughs> so now I could enjoy the rest of the trip. After breakfast, Pedro came by to take us on a hiking trip in the forest. It was so wonderful. The fresh air, the birds singing. Well, maybe except for the heat and the mosquitoes. Pedro wanted to bring us to this spot he said was perfect for watching the sunset. Awesome! It was all going well at first, but then as Rose avoided a tree branch, it accidentally hit my mom. My god, you hit me on purpose, didn't you? What? That's absurd. I was just avoiding the branch. Oh, please. As if. Are you saying that I'm lying? Hey, guys, stop it. Let's be more understanding and talk things out. Like how you did it last night, okay? That's when I found out that they were just pretending to be friends so that I didn't set up any more dinners for them. Oh my god, unbelievable! After their friendship act was exposed, they began speed hiking, like they were in a competition or something. But yep, after only 15 minutes, they were exhausted and couldn't even stand straight anymore. I began to shout at them. This is great! Your dumb feud is ruining my vacation! Then I walked away to avoid them, but of course, not too far. As I walked, I tried to think of another plan to get them close. Then I realized I'd wandered further away from the group. Okay, Avery, don't panic. Pedro had given me a map of the forest. I just needed to get to that marked X. It sounded easy. Trust me, it wasn't. I walked for hours and still couldn't find the spot. Oh no, it was getting dark and I was totally exhausted. I sat on the ground and couldn't hold back my tears. I was about to lose hope when I suddenly heard Rose and Mom's voices. Oh great, I was lost and could still hear them arguing in my head. I must be losing my mind. But wait, suddenly... They appeared from behind some trees. It was really them. I couldn't believe it. I ran into their arms and gave them both the biggest hug ever and cried like a baby. Before we went to the airport to head home, Pedro came to say goodbye. Thanks for the hiking trip and also carrying out my plan. No problem. Your plan was definitely crazy, but it totally worked. After you went missing, they actually teamed up to find you. They helped one another when one tripped down or got exhausted and kept each other motivated. Pedro grinned at me, then continued. I too was freaking out when I didn't see you at our meeting point. Luckily, I still found you. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that pretending to be lost was a part of my plan, but what I didn't expect was to actually get lost. Thank God for Pedro. And you know what? After that incident... My mom and Rose grew close. Actually, a bit too close, I think. <laughs> they even sometimes hang out without me. Can you believe it? Turns out, even though they have two very different personalities and styles, they still have one big thing in common. They both love me. Hi there, I'm Anita, a science pro and robotics prodigy. I've won countless trophies, including one for making a talking replica of BB-8. But it's my crush's heart that I can't win. Tom has just refused to accompany me to the last middle school dance. But who cares? I've got my bestie Barb. It'll still be fun. We can go together. We arrived at the dance to find that everyone had dates, except for us. Well, this is a little awkward. Move. This is a dance floor, grannies. Either you dance or get out. Bet this is the first party you've ever got to attend. As if Tom would go out with such a loser. Yeah, you should try asking your robots out instead. As they walked off laughing, I felt so disheartened. Barb told me not to listen to them, but their words niggled away at me. I realized if I didn't change, then I'd waste the rest of my teen years by being a loser that got left out of all the fun. I needed to reinvent myself now before it was too late. 
Over the summer break, I thought it over and realized that there was only one way forward. I should flip the script, where nobody knew who I was. And this is the perfect occasion for that. High school! I purposely chose a school that's across the city. It's a bit inconvenient, but that's how to be sure I'd not run into anyone from my local middle school. Of course, except for Barb. She's going there with me also. Hey, recognize me? I'm still Anita. Like my new look? I've had a style update, ditched my glasses, and all the uncool geeky stuff. Ooh, let's surprise my bestie. <laughs> Anita? Whoa, talk about a Captain Marvel transformation. Gee, thanks. This hair color is so in season right now. Hang on, you look just like Chelsea. Oh, do I? How funny. You sound like her too. Okay, so Chelsea was this popular girl from middle school. Um, yeah, I may have spent all summer studying her. All right, I actually mirrored her style and mannerisms. I'm just learning to better myself. This isn't any different from using humans as models when programming a robot. Besides, it's not like Chelsea's here to mind. Speaking of robots, how's your BB-8? No, that's my past. We'll never be cool and get boyfriends if our peers think we're nerds. Come with me after school. I'll give you a makeover too. It's okay, Anita. I don't mind being a nerd. But if this makes you happy, then you have my full support. My sweet, naive Barb has no idea how incredible being cool would be. They're the cool kids here, aka celebrities. They're so dazzling and popular. And oh my god, who's that? He's so dreamy. So I confidently strutted over to introduce myself to the whole group one. Ah! Luckily, no one seemed to notice my fall, or they just didn't care. <sighs> Anyways, this was only my first day here. I had loads of time to fit in with the celebrities. And then catch that hottie, who supposedly named Eric's attention. At first, the popular girls didn't notice me, but then a few days in, Lou, the celebrity's leader, had a lipstick emergency and I sprung to her rescue. See? I told you, this burgundy shade really pops against your cool undertone. Ruby Woo? That's so 2015, Ashley. You can put that away. And easy peasy, I became part of the group. They invited me to their parties, shopping trips, and spa days. It's like entering a completely new world. An extra shiny one. I got to sit with them at lunch where they Ubered low-calorie food. Normally, I had the same as them, but today my mom packed me a special sandwich with the moist maker, just like Ross's from Friends. Sorry, guys, but Anita doesn't share food. <laughs> Are you seriously going to drink that? You can practically see the fat and lactose swirling in it. Gross. Oh, okay. Looks like the moist maker would have to wait. I looked around and saw Barb sharing her mom's amazeballs mac and cheese with her new geeky friends. I've not spoken to Barb properly in weeks. We kept trying to reschedule as I had manicures with Lou, Haley's party, and all these ever after school shopping trips. Which kept getting so expensive. Aren't you gonna buy that? You haven't bought anything. Um, that's because I only wear tailor-made clothes made of Egyptian cotton or at least silk linen. Um, okay. In that case, you can be our assistant. Make sure you wear a cute cardigan tomorrow for a OOTD Instagram post. Ashley has made a list of the available colors. That's why I had to use all of my allowance on this cardigan. But it's fine. That's just how popular clicks had to be. And it's so nice of them to let me hang around. I proudly strutted alongside the celebs, looking just like one of them. Other students gobbed at us, and it sure felt good. But suddenly, this dizzy spell came over me. I started shaking and feeling cold, then pitch black. I woke up in the infirmary to Barb's worried face. Oh good, you're awake. It's no surprise you passed out. You aren't eating enough. What? I'm eating just fine. Besides, skinny is chic. I'm not arguing with you. You're lucky your head didn't hit the floor thanks to Eric. Eric saved me? He must have caught me like in a romantic movie. This diet is amazing. I wouldn't have been in Eric's arms without it. Later, I tried to thank him, but he put his headphones on and walked off. And I never saw him at any of the celeb's parties or anything. A hot guy like him is probably hanging out with an even cooler clique and interested in even more popular girls. I need to try harder. But my geeky side wasn't going to stay suppressed. One time, this guy slated Spider-Man 2099, my favorite character ever. Dude doesn't understand how the multiverse works, and his suit sucks. Are you kidding me? As if you know how it works, his suit incorporates Parker tech and has stealth features and exploding spider saucers. Okay, cool it, new girl. It's just some weirdo jumps around in spandex. Right, be cool. Cool kids didn't geek out over superheroes. Luckily, everyone else seemed distracted. I turned to look and saw them already flocked around some new kid with a huge backpack, a comic t-shirt, and jeans. Huh, it's like looking at middle school me. When I managed to get a closer look, I almost fell over in shock. 
It was Chelsea! Why would pretty, popular Chelsea do a total 180 on her looks? I tried to avoid Chelsea, but then one time when I was trying to approach Eric, she appeared, and he actually spoke to her. Does Chelsea know Eric? Since when? How come? Ah! Time stopped as I stared into his big, dreamy eyes, but falling for each other again? <laughs> he might as well just stay in his arms. I quickly walked away and passed Chelsea. Our eyes met. Did she recognize me? She didn't say anything, but was that a smirk I saw? I needed to find out if Chelsea really recognized me, so I turned to Barb. It was a bit awkward, as we hadn't spoken in a while. But luckily, Barb was cool about it and said she'd try to find out. We chatted a bit, and then she asked me, We are still going to Comic-Con on the 7th, right? Yeah, of course. Can't wait. I was excited about Comic-Con until... A few days later, the celebrities had a big announcement. They were attending Conan Gray's concert on the 7th. Are you coming, or do you have some tragic nerdy convention to go to? Huh? That's oddly specific. I panicked and said yes to the concert. We had to give money to Asher the next day, and she would take care of purchasing everyone's tickets. But thanks to that overpriced cardigan, how am I supposed to afford this? Hmm, I guess there was one way to pay for it. Me and Barb's Comic-Con fund, which we'd been saving since middle school. I was only borrowing and would definitely pay it back. The following day, the celebs gathered to discuss the concert. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flustered-looking Barb. What about our plan? Did you just spend all your savings on some concert you don't even care about? I'm sorry, I promise I'll pay you back. I just needed some time. So, you spent my share too? How could you? I felt terrible. I never meant to upset my friend like that. I just really wanted to fit in. Only, after that day, I found myself miserable with the celebs. The more time I spent with them, the more things about them got me second-guessing this group's dynamic. For instance, they talked a lot about the importance of being eco-friendly, but ordered Uber Eats almost every day, and constantly brought new, cute, reusable straws in Stanley Cups. Moreover, it was always lose weight or the highway, and they even trash-talked their own group members behind their backs. I found myself often looking around for Barb and then feeling extra guilty. On my way home, I was dragging my feet, feeling awful, when I passed an appliance store. I saw some students from my school's robotics team struggling with their droid, so I gladly offered a hand. If you want my lunch money, take it, but please leave Gears Brosnan alone! We worked hard on it! I tried explaining that I just wanted to help, but they kept pushing me away. I stared down at myself and realized that I wasn't welcomed because I'd given up everything to look like a celebrity. However, I didn't feel like one. I'd stood by and let the celebs push everyone else around. Was this really the life I wanted? That weekend was supposed to be spa day with the celebs, so I went out to the mall to ask Lou for my concert ticket. I was gonna sell it and pay Barb back. Only when I got there, I saw Chelsea with them, but she looked like her cool self again. Uh-oh, I better go. But too late, Chelsea caught me and told everyone. Guys, look who's here. Fun fact, Anita and I used to be friends back in middle school. Cover yourself in foundation all you want, but your nerdiness will still show. Everyone started laughing, and that's when it dawned on me. They were all in on Chelsea's plans to expose me. I wanted to leave, but I still needed my ticket back. Sure, you can have it back, but on one condition. Wash off your Chelsea disguise and go back to being pathetic little you again. And so they told me to wash my hair in this decorative basin in a lush store before everyone's confused eyes and their live streaming cameras. I swallowed my pride and did it for Barb. But afterward, Lou turned back on her word. Actually, I gave it to Chelsea. Tough luck. Oops, too bad I never agreed to the deal Lou made with you. I felt overcome with panic and shame. I ran and I bumped into someone. Eric! Seeing how upset I was, he took me for coffee and a chat. As soon as we sat down, I burst into tears and told him how I'd lost everything. My popularity, dignity, friends. It all started to fall apart when Chelsea turned up all of a sudden, and then the domino effect took over. Chelsea? I'd always known she's catty, but I never thought she'd go that far. How can you be friends with her? <laughs> what? No, it's not what you think. You still don't recognize me? What do you mean, recognize? Then he revealed that he was from my middle school. I was shooketh! But if I squinted real hard, I guess he did look vaguely familiar. Whoa, puberty hit you like a truck. Same for you. Yeah, no, it wasn't puberty for me. I got emotionally scarred from being an outcast and became afraid of missing out on cool stuff, so I turned myself into a Chelsea clone to be popular. That's insane. But if it means anything, I prefer the old you. It's great seeing you at the school. 
but when I saw that you changed and joined the celebs, I was kind of apprehensive. But for real, though, I would have died for you to notice me. I was beyond surprised. He liked me all along? Suddenly, Chelsea jumped in. Why has it always been her? I changed myself to look like her. Didn't you say you liked nerdy girls? So why not me? Say what? Chelsea liked Eric? So she really copied my look. And for that reason? I'm sorry, Chelsea, but it's my feelings. I can't believe you rejected me twice for this little nerd, and she doesn't even look like herself anymore. Chelsea, it's never been about looks. It's about who she is. In the midst of it, I finally understood something. I was fine just being me. I never needed to be anything else. I've switched schools and turned myself into a dork for you. Ah! You're lucky this time. I watched Chelsea stomp out. I realized how I was constantly anxious and on edge that I'd messed up while hanging out with the celebrities. I missed the truly happy moments with real friends where I could just be me. All this time, I thought I'd been missing out on all the fun, but turns out, I missed nothing. The true way to have beautiful teenage years is to spend it with people that really appreciate you and do the things that you actually enjoy. I thanked Eric, then left. There was something important I needed to do first. I went home and fixed my BB-8, then took it over to Barb's house. Sorry, Barb. I'm so sorry, Barb. I was so desperate to be cool that I overlooked what really mattered. I miss you and our friendship so much. I missed you too. And I saw that humiliating video and just wanted to know you were okay. On second thoughts, I'll forgive you if you give me your BB-8. <laughs> no can do, as I'm selling it online to make money to pay you back. I only brought it here to make my apology more meaningful. Did it work? We both hug. The next few days at school, I tried my best to fix things. I returned to my old image, well, with a slight upgrade. I can't let my beauty skills go to waste now. And I dug out all my geeky stuff. I showed up at the robotics club, and this time, I confidently strode over and immediately fixed their robot. I told you I could help. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's a celebrity's job. Look at you, all happy and smiley with your own loser nerd kind. Yeah, I'm happy. While you once tried and failed to be one of us, remember? Being a nerd isn't just about appearance, it's about what's inside. By the way, how was the concert? I heard your fanatic behavior got you kicked out. Sounds exciting. Chelsea and the celebs looked fuming as they sashayed off. But I didn't care, as I was finally back where I belonged. It was the last lap and I was in the final stretch. There was only one car ahead of me and I could see the finish line coming close. So I pushed on the acceleration as far as it could go. Suddenly I heard a weird noise coming from the engine and lost control at once. The car started spinning like crazy and off the track onto the grass. Hi, I'm Natalie and it's me behind that wheel. You may be wondering how I got myself into that situation. So let's begin from the start. I was born into a racing family, so the passion for sports naturally ran in my veins. But my life somehow resembled Maggie Payton in the movie Herbie, as my dad didn't allow me to race. Instead, he put all his faith in my adopted brother Jeremy, and by pouring everything he knew into teaching him, with a hope that he'd become a great racer. Only the explanation to this wasn't as complex as in the movie. My mom passed away when I was a newborn, but no vehicle accident was involved. It's just my dad was of the opinion that, Ladies should be gentle and sweet. So he forbade me from participating in racing or anything even remotely dangerous. Despite that, growing up with Jeremy by my side was truly a blessing. Although not related by blood, we were very close. Jeremy often let me take the wheel of his race car without dad knowing, and he even taught me all he had learned from dad. Over time, I was able to catch up to him in terms of racing prowess. Today, he had a big race, and as usual, I went to his room to check on him. But he was still in bed. His face was pale, and obviously, he was in pain. Jeremy, what's wrong? I think I got food poisoning from that gas station hot dog. Gosh, just drop it. You can't drive in this condition. I can't. This is the qualifying round for the championship season. Dad will be so disappointed in me. So, there's only one way. Hey, I can drive in your place. Are you crazy, Natty? Blah! Jesus, see? There's no time. Under the racing gear, nobody can tell us apart. He was reluctant for a while, but finally gave in. So here I am, in a super cool appearance. I felt a wave of exhilaration that sent me sprinting to the track. Passing other racers with deft accuracy, I left trails of smoke in my wig as I smoothly swerved into the tight turns. When I reached the final lap, I gave it my all and finished in first place. Yippee! I got back to the waiting area after the race, then was suddenly dragged away. Hey, Jeremy's here. I'm all right now. Just want to make sure you made it out okay. Congrats on first place. Thank you. 
Now, switch clothes with me. They need to see your face on the podium. As Jeremy raised up the trophy, I couldn't help but imagine myself in his place, overcome with happiness. That evening, the race was replayed on TV. Jeremy, your style is different today. You finally understood how to drive more freely. I've always said you have potential, yet you don't have the guts to shatter limitations. But if you keep racing like that, we may need to get you another trophy shelf. Uh, yes, I'll try. You were really cool today. Keep up the good work. After that race, I still felt the electric rush lingering in my bones. So I asked Jeremy to let me keep taking his place. Enough, Natty. Last time I did it as a last resort. You don't really want to be a racer anyway. Let me help you. In the meantime, you can focus on your passion. Seeing him hesitate, I continued. If you're afraid of being caught, just be there at all times so we can swap back whenever we need to. Jeremy's Jeremy. Couldn't say no to my puppy eyes. After that, I wore Jeremy's racing suit and entered all of his competitions. During that time, Jeremy would covertly hide among the crowd and wait. Oh, did I mention that my brother is a huge crochet fanatic? He even runs an Etsy business stocked with incredible pieces he made all by himself. Things were going kind of smoothly, but public practice was out of the question because we had to keep this a secret from dad. So Jeremy's plan was for me to pretend to be dating the team mechanic, Royce, also his best friend. This would give me an excuse to go to the track on a regular basis to practice. The following day, Jeremy took me to meet Royce, and luckily he was so friendly and agreed to assist us right away. Although balancing school and racing was hard, I still nailed it beautifully. At school, nobody knew I came from a racing family as we never appeared together in public. Not to brag, but a lot of guys were smitten with me. However, this dude, Liam, stood out. He's actually Jeremy's biggest racing rival, so I couldn't help but laugh internally as he made many attempts at wooing me in school. If you were a vegetable, you'd be a cute-cumber. Just to turn green with envy at me on the racetrack, as he had no idea it was me under this costume. <laughs> it made sense, given he hadn't lost to Jeremy this many times before. Yeah! Hey, Jeremy, what's your deal? Your racing style has changed so drastically. Just then, a staff member from our team turns to me. Yeah, and you've been really quiet lately. Uh, um, <clears throat> I'm just focusing on the competition. And so this began my official rivalry between Liam and I. We were racing neck and neck, but all of a sudden my engine died and stopped in the middle of the track. I watched as a few cars zoomed past me and Liam took the win. My win. Seeing that dude get out of his car and reveal his smug face had my blood boiling. The next week, I was in another race to make up for last week's fiasco, but this time I had a flat tire. Were the racing gods against me beating Liam? Due to my recent losing streak, some of my sponsors threatened to have their sponsorship withdrawn if I don't win the next race. So this time, I got Royce to double check. No, triple check that the car was ready to race. I scrutinized every nook and cranny, same as the last few races. If something goes wrong again, then my guess is that you have a petty guy willing to sabotage you. My next race was going well, but on the last lap, as I reached a tight turn, I pressed on the brake and my car was not slowing down. Time seemed to slow as the wall rushed closer. My palms clenched the steering wheel. It was a dance of split-second decisions and instinct, but I managed to swerve, the tire screeching in protest as I narrowly avoided disaster. Close shave. I looked over to the finish line and saw that Liam had once again secured first place. He was definitely behind this. So I quickly got changed and barged into Liam's waiting room to confront him. Oh, my angel. What are you doing in this fiery battlefield? It's you who played tricks on me, my brother, right? Spit it out. Your brother? Who? Jeremy Wilson? You sabotaged someone else's car too, or what? What are you talking about? Drop the act. You're the one who benefits the most if my brother loses. Recently, his car kept breaking down. This can't be a coincidence. It just seems like luck is on my side. See, the girl I like also happens to come from a famous racing family. We're a match made in heaven. How can you be so casual about this? Don't you know how dangerous it is to drive with broken brakes? If not for my driving skills, I would have been injured. Wait, your driving skills? Were you the one driving the car? Um, I mean, my brother. Oh my god, it's you! I knew something's off lately. Watch your tongue. I, I didn't say anything. Focus on the actual conversation. You either confess to the crime or I will investigate and expose your true face to the whole world. Mark my words. 
I couldn't believe I just let my secret slip to my biggest rival. If Jeremy knew this, he'd definitely tell me to quit racing. So after a sleepless night, I decided to meet Liam for a proper talk, but he found me first. Are you Google? Cause you have everything I'm searching for. Stop messing around. I'm not done with you yet. The you broke my car case? I had no idea about it, I swear. I'm competitive, but not that low. But isn't it normal for a car to suddenly break down sometimes? Put that aside. Anyway, have you told anyone about my identity yet? No, but what's up with that? I want you to keep your mouth shut. So let's make a deal. What do you want? Except for a date like in some sappy rom-coms, of course. Then nothing. Just don't avoid me anymore. And tell me why you have to disguise as your brother. That's none of your business. All right, then I'll ask someone else. Ugh, fine. Just promise you won't tell anyone. Then I told Liam everything. And since that day, he had officially become my shadow. No matter at school or on the track. I need to complain to Spotify for not naming you this week's hottest single. Oh wow, they really look cute together. Even though they're competitors, love always wins. And that's how we accidentally became a gay couple in the racing scene. At first, I found Liam very annoying, but soon I realized his great passion for racing matched my own, and his insights into the racing world were unexpectedly captivating. I found myself opening up to Liam, sharing my thoughts and feelings with ease, and somehow felt happy around him. But the mystery around my broken car hadn't unfolded, so I couldn't let my guard down. And here comes the last qualifying match before the championships. My dad was also here today to motivate everyone. I was so nervous, yet still had to act lovey-dovey with Royce in front of dad. Obviously, Liam wasn't happy about that. He kept coming in between us, even though he knew we were just pretending. Natalie, focus! I couldn't stand to keep my secret any longer. So I gotta carry the day to prove myself, then reveal the truth to him and race under my own identity. I turned on the engine's full power and felt its huge force as I raced. My helmet fought the wind, and the air surge was like a thrilling symphony. It was the last lap, and I was in the final stretch. There was only one car ahead of me, Liam's car, and I could see the finish line coming close. So I pushed on the acceleration as far as it could go. As I raced past him, I was both precise and fast. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could feel an adrenaline rush through my body. Suddenly, a strange sound came from my car, and I lost control at once. The car started spinning like crazy and off the track onto the grass. I was dizzy, but lucky enough, not a scratch. As I came to, the first person I saw was Liam. He dropped everything just to check that I was okay. He took me to my pit stop, where my teammates rushed over to support. Suddenly, my dad appeared. I was panicking, and I didn't know where to go or hide when... Natalie, no need to hide anymore. I already know. <sighs> How? That doesn't matter. Look at you. What a mess. I just wanted to prove to you that I can do it. This is my passion. Why do you always stop me? Your passion? You mean falling off the track? You just ignored all the times I'd won first place. You're a terrible, selfish, evil father who has no love for your children and always forces others to do this, do that. People don't respect you because they want to. Everyone only listens to you because they're afraid of you, just like me and Jeremy. Just then, Dad slapped me hard across the cheek. I stumbled back and fell onto Liam. It was you, wasn't it? I, uh, I'm sorry. I just couldn't watch you get yourself in danger anymore. Meeting you is my entire life's greatest regret. Before anyone could see me cry, I ran away. I have nothing left. No one understands me. No one. I lay there in my room, consumed by a cloud of gloom after Dad's week-long grounding. Suddenly, a pebble knocked at my window. It was Liam. He was trying to throw a rope up to me. After a moment of hesitation, I finally climbed down. I'm sorry I went behind your back. I didn't know your dad would go that far. I care about you and just want you to be safe. But now I realize the way to do that is to find the true culprit who vandalized your car. Liam's apology felt really sincere. Look at him. I couldn't stay mad forever. The last time you raced, you never left your car side. The pre-checks are where we need to look into. Are you sure you can fully trust this Royce guy? He's my brother's best friend. Why would he sabotage me? You're just being subjective. Suddenly, a memory resurfaced in me. <gasps> last week, I saw Royce lingering around the car for longer than the usual inspection. He told me that I need a new head gasket or else I wouldn't be able to accelerate without blowing the engine. Now, when I think of it, it seems kind of fishy. So we rushed to Royce's shop immediately. Natalie, what are you doing here? I'm sorry to hear things have been rough between you and your dad. 
but you're not sorry for almost taking my life? What are you talking about? Cut the act. I've got all the evidence against you. What evidence? Shut up. I have CCTV footage of your criminal acts. If I give it to the racing committee, you'll be out for good. What do you think? My hands were trembling as I hoped that Royce couldn't see through my bluff. But shockingly, Royce's face went pale and he crumbled to the ground. All right, Natalie, it's me. But I didn't mean to hurt you. I just want to help Jeremy. How does that help Jeremy? Actually, I have a crush on him and Jeremy confided in me once. I don't know what to do. I love Natalie very much, but I always feel self-conscious in front of her. I'm just an adopted child. Becoming a racer is all that my dad wishes for me. If I stop racing, he won't love me anymore. Meanwhile, Natalie's far better than me from the beginning. If dad finds out I'm such a loser, he will disown me. Jeremy, my poor brother. I just wanted to scare you into not racing. Everything I did to your car was carefully deliberated beforehand so that you wouldn't get hurt. I'm sorry. I'll find a way to fix everything. I got home later that night, only to hear arguing from the living room. What you did to Natalie was unfair. You kept her from doing what she loves, just like me. I've never dared to admit this, but now, Dad, racing isn't my passion. This is. What? But you find it too girly, right? Actually, I just race to please you. And only this simple thing makes me happy. Unable to stand by, I interjected, revealing how Jeremy was living in so much fear among his own family. They were shocked for a moment. Then Dad said, Jeremy, it's all my fault to put so much pressure on you and make you feel like you weren't loved enough. You're always my son, no matter if you choose racing or not. And Natalie, I'm sorry for hitting you. The pain on your cheek may have gone, but still lingers in my hand. I just didn't want to risk losing you. I never told you this, but when your mother was pregnant with you, she got sick, and I could have lost both of you when she went into labor. Ever since that day, I swore to keep you safe, alive, and healthy. Dad, I love you, but I love racing too. I hope that I can count on your support on the track. Then I revealed that Royce was the one who sabotaged my car. They were both shocked and furious, especially Jeremy. But after being told the full story, they decided to forgive Royce as he showed his remorse by confessing his crime and was temporarily suspended. We had not seen him since then. True compassion lies not only in caring for someone, but also in caring for them in the right way. Misguided intentions can unintentionally sow the seeds of unintended consequences. Finally, I could officially join the race using my own name. Dad came to see me today as well. He seemed quite concerned, but encouraged me anyway. Suddenly, Liam approached me. If I win this time, fair and square, would you go on a date with me? You have no chance to win, but a date? You earned it. Hi guys, it's me, Claire. So, tomorrow is going to be super exciting. I'm putting my life in your hands, literally, as I'm going to be doing a My Instagram Followers Control My Day video. Yay! Most influencers do this with options, but I trust you guys, so go wild. Just visit my Instagram, like this video, and comment on whatever you want me to do tomorrow. The comments with the most likes will be chosen, and don't forget to follow me to stay updated. As you can see, I'm Claire, and I'm a beauty influencer on Instagram. Of course, with this pretty face and eye for style, I already have loads of followers. But for someone who was born to be famous like me, that's not enough. That's why I'm doing this viral challenge. It'll get me tens of thousands of likes. Okay, that's it for today. Now I better get my beauty sleep. Gotta have glowing skin tomorrow. The first thing to do in the morning was to check my Instagram. 20,000 likes from my post last night. That's average. Let's see. I asked my followers to decide what I should wear and what I should eat for breakfast. And the most liked comments were about Y2K style and avocado toast. My favorite dish anyway. Easy peasy. I called the maid to prepare breakfast while I did my skincare routine. Then I made sure I took a cute selfie and uploaded it to my story. What a good start. Am I the cutest girl on earth or what? Okay, now I have to make a very difficult decision. Which bag best compliments my outfit? This one or this one? I was still trying to decide when my phone rang. Ugh, that's Liam, my boyfriend. It's so early, yet he's already sent me a ton of messages. What are you doing? Why didn't you reply to any of my texts? Hurry up if you don't want to be late for school.
All right, all right, I'm coming. Jeez, why does he have to be so stressy? It doesn't matter if we're a little late. I mean, come on, it's only school. After choosing the right bag, I got into Liam's car. He frowned at me and asked me what took so long. I was busy taking selfies. I replied and posted a mirror selfie I took earlier on my Instagram with the caption, Y2K style for today. What should I do at school this morning? At break time, I was sitting in the cafeteria with Liam and my bestie, Tori. As usual, my beauty was attracting attention. All eyes were on me, and one guy even gushed out, You're so pretty, Claire. <laughs> I checked my Instagram to see how my newly posted pic was doing. Oh, it already had 50,000 likes. That's good, but I know with my charisma, I can do even better. But, huh? What's this? The most liked comment on the post wants me to go to the school library and scream, I hate studying and the library is the most boring place on earth. What kind of request is this? Don't do it. I don't have a good feeling about this. It could be from someone who's trying to sabotage you. Liam has a point. This could just be a trick that Isabella, my rival at school, devised to embarrass me. She's also an influencer on Instagram, but she just copies everything I do. Her Instagram is 5,000 followers less than mine. Yawn. But Claire, how are you going to explain to your followers if you bail out? I don't think they'd be happy about it. Hmm, right. I'm doing a challenge, aren't I? Can't stop after only two comments, especially because one from anti-fan. Besides, this is no big deal, right? Who even goes to the library anymore? So, I dragged Liam and Tori to the library. As you know, I need them to film me. Huh? Why was it so ridiculously busy in here? Since when did people actually want to study? I needed to get this over with. So breaking through the silence, I shouted, I hate studying, and the library is the most boring place on earth. All eyes instantly fell on me, and I heard tuts and grunts. Then someone said, What the hell are you doing? Ugh, why is everyone in here so serious? I just shrugged and walked away. At least Liam and Tori had captured me at my best angle. To my surprise, that video gained me a load of views and likes, and I even earned nearly 1,000 more followers. Who would have thought that such a silly act would get so popular? At that moment, Isabella walked past me. Only brainless people would scream in the library. Huh, look who's jealous now. Hey, you might as well try that. Maybe you'll get half of my followers. Isabella looks like she's about to explode with anger. <laughs> but then she sneered and said, Let's see if you're still laughing after you see what you've got to do next. Huh? What is she on about? I immediately opened my Insta to check. What? The top comment this time was from Isabella. She wants me to put a trash bag on my head and go to the mall. Ew, trash bag? I spent an hour styling my hair this morning. Isabella, you wicked witch. But okay, if she wants to play, I'll prove to her that she's messing with the wrong person. Just like last time, Liam tried to talk me out of it. This is nonsense, Claire. Don't lower yourself to this level just for a few likes. I told him he was overreacting and that I wasn't going to let my followers down by bottling out of it. This seemed to annoy him, and he stormed off. Um, so who's going to take videos for me? I called out, but Liam just kept walking. Why can't he just support me like usual? Luckily, I still had Tori, and she agreed to film it for me. That's what best friends are for. Okay, this is more embarrassing than I thought. People keep staring at me like I'm an alien. I gave them a, what are you looking at, stare prompting them to quickly turn away. No, I have to act confidently for the video to get more likes. Looking over, I saw Tori cheering me on, so I took a deep breath, stood up straight, and did my best catwalk strut through the mall. My heart was pounding like crazy, even after we walked out of the mall. Phew, it was finally over. 
I then quickly opened up my Insta, uploaded the video I just shot, then texted Liam asking where he was. After that, Tori and I got in a taxi to his house. Liam was already waiting for me at the door, looking all serious when I got there. So I told Tori to wait in the taxi. Then angrily I shouted as I walked over to him, You could have at least come and supported me. Do you know how upset I was when you just left like that? I wasn't comfortable filming you make a fool of yourself. I care about you too much. It's just a bit of harmless fun. Why can't you understand how important being an influencer is to me? <sighs> I don't think I can be with someone who doesn't support me and my passion anymore. We should break up. Then I just walked away, not giving Liam a chance to explain. He quickly ran over and grabbed my hand. Okay, I'm sorry. Can we talk it out? <laughs> it worked! I gestured to Tori, then turned around with a big smile at Liam. Can you believe the followers want me to test your love by pretending to break up with you? I'll show them how much you love me. But then, unexpectedly, Liam angrily shouted, What? So, I'm just another tool to get likes for your Instagram? If you want to break up, then fine, we're done. Then he stormed into his house and slammed the door. I stood there open-mouthed. How could he break up with me? In the whole two years we've been together, I've never seen him this mad. I'll let him chill for a bit and talk to him tomorrow. He'll have calmed down by then. Right? Look, Claire! Your shopping mall video has already reached a hundred thousand likes! Oh my god, what is this? People are going crazy for my videos. They say I'm so confident, wearing a trash bag and still looking stylish. I look like Kendall Jenner. And my followers also increased by 5,000 people. At least this is worth the effort I put in. The next morning, I waited for Liam to pick me up. But he never arrived. When I got to school, I tracked him down and asked if he was still mad at me. You're so addicted to social media. I don't even know who you are anymore. Then he walked off. At that exact moment, Isabella walked towards me. Wait, why is Tori with her? Hey, loser. You're in so much trouble. What does that mean? I looked at Tori in confusion, but she just lowered her head and quickly followed Isabella. Feeling something was wrong, I immediately opened Instagram and... Oh my god. What are these comments? Such an attention seeker. She's willing to do anything just for some likes. I heard that her boyfriend broke up with her. No surprises there. <laughs> what is this? I did all these things at their requests, and now I'm the one receiving all the hate? Suddenly, the principal announced via the loudspeaker that I had to go to his office. As I walked in, I saw my parents sitting there. Turns out, news of what I did at the library had spread. But not only that, someone even accused me of stealing from the shopping mall. Huh? I didn't steal anything. To prove my innocence, I gave the principal my bag to check. And he pulled out a brand new necklace. Why is this thing in my bag? I tried explaining myself, but no one would listen. I was suspended for a week. The walk out of the principal's office was the worst thing ever. Everyone was giving me judging looks and whispering to each other. On the way home, I took a teary selfie and posted it on Instagram with the caption, Consequences of yesterday's challenge. One week suspension. Someone put the blame on me. Once home, my ashamed-looking parents immediately took my phone away and even disconnected the Wi-Fi. Ugh! My life was over. I ran up to my room in a huff and flopped down onto my bed. Suddenly, my eyes crossed a photo I took with Liam on my birthday last year. That's when Liam threw me a surprise party, and he even made me a cute birthday cake. Come to think of it, I was a bit too harsh with him yesterday. He was only trying to protect me. If I'd listened to him, I wouldn't have all these hate comments and be stuck home for a week. I hurt Liam just to gain more followers. How could I be so stupid? 
I wished I could apologize to him right now, but... <sighs> then to my surprise, after just three days, my mom told me I was allowed back to school. There were still mutters about me, but that didn't matter, as Liam was waiting for me at my locker. I hurried over to him, apologized, and explained everything. Claire, I know you're the sweetest, most loving girl. You just got carried away with your frivolous Instagram popularity. Besides, I know you're not a thief. Then Liam told me that out of suspicion, he asked to check different CCTV at the shopping mall and discovered that it was Tori who dropped the necklace box into my bag. Turns out, she was only hanging out with me because I was famous and rich. So when Isabella paid her, she turned 180 degrees, running after Isabella and playing tricks on me. Liam reported this to the principal, and now both of them have been suspended. That's it. Chasing after popularity on the internet didn't bring me any real friends, but only virtual fans, and a fake friend, sadly. I got blindsided by the likes and followers and overlooked what was truly important, my real-life relationships and the people who genuinely care for me. After that incident, I decided to deactivate my Instagram account for a while, at least until I feel stable again. And even if I lose all my followers, I don't really mind anymore. Because right now, I'm spending time with those who really matter to me. I was skipping to the kitchen to see the apple bag Dad had prepared for my school picnic. Aww, how thoughtful of him. I excitedly took a bite, but it tasted like it had been left to rot for a decade. I frantically checked the bag and saw this was not the only bad one. Dad! Hey, I'm Doris, and things like this are an everyday occurrence for me. My dad's clumsy and colorblind, two contributing factors that sure make life interesting. Since mom passed away, I had to watch him like a hawk, else you betcha he'd mess stuff up. One time he roasted a turkey, but it was so raw as if it would jump off the plate and run around the house. And on my last birthday, he got me a pair of mittens with one bright orange and one neon green. I reluctantly tried them on, looking like a clown while people burst out laughing. Despite all that, he's still an awesome dad in my eyes. A super talented artist with incredible artwork, provided he lets me label the paint colors. And also a really big supporter of my dream. From the first time he helped me skate on the lake, I knew it was my life's calling. If I can be an artist even though I'm colorblind, how can just a few bumps stop you from being a figure skater? Bravo, I'll definitely give him a 100. Except that he does have one bonkers rule. No dating until I'm 18. Whatever, it's not like I gave boys much thought. The only boy I spoke to was my neighbor, Ben, and dad seemed to like him. That kid's pretty good. He likes drawing and artists are caring people, just like me. <laughs> and he seems to not attract it to girls either. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but it's true that we can never be a couple. His mushy manner is definitely not my type. Anyway, it's super fun having him as a friend. Since we were little, Ben always went along with anything I asked, from drawing me a unicorn picture from my room, giving me his only ice pop, to more exciting things, such as knocks and runs, and covering the neighbor's car in toilet paper. <laughs> and now, he always escorts me to my skating practice a few towns away, and just sits there scribbling something until I finish. This whole month, I've been practicing so hard for the upcoming big competition in town. I'm gonna bring a medal home. This is my time to shine! I started gliding, letting the rhythm control my movement. The cold, calming breeze pushed against me like I was flying. It's time for an axle jump. I sprang into the air like a cotton ball, but suddenly lost my balance and fell flat on my face. As a result, I was ranked 29 out of 30. Duh. But surprisingly, there was one judge giving me all high marks. Finally, someone saw my potential. I was beaming when this cute guy approached me. Hi, I'm Luke. Just wanted to say that you were absolutely on point out there. Oh, he's that guy! I really want to get to know you more. How about we hang out together? I'll take you somewhere as special as you are to me. This is definitely against Dad's rule, but oh boy, his killer smile made my stomach swoosh. So I ended up saying yes. I excitedly told Ben, but he gave me this sour face look. Hey, your dad will not be happy if he knows this. Just don't let him know. Luke is an expert, so he can help me hone in on my talent. You will keep this a secret, won't you? 
So here's my first date ever. Luke was so sweet. He complimented my ice skating and constantly gave me these loving looks. Our food arrived and delish. Bon appetit. I daintily tried the mashed potato and immediately felt the delicious taste of warm butter and chives and something pointy? A hairpin? I quickly stood up, demanding to see the manager, but Luke stopped me. Babe, you found the gift I prepared for you. Then he grabbed the hairpin and wiped it on his shirt and put it on my hair. <laughs> Maybe this was a normal thing for guys to do on dates, right? Only his gifts show didn't stop there. Later I found a ring in my steak, then a keychain in my salad. You're cute, just like this Lotso. Isn't he the bad guy? But the cherries on top were the movie tickets in my sandwich. Luke, what's this about? I just hope we could bond over watching movies together. You hate it that much? No, no, I didn't mean that. Think about it. It was kind of weird, but also the sweetest thing that had ever happened to me. Luke had a funny way of showing it, but he made me feel special and giddy. And maybe in love? Before I could think straight, he was leaning closer to me. I closed my eyes and was ready for the most romantic kiss ever. But why were his lips so hard and unmoving? What? The menu? And holding it was... Dad? You know this crazy old man? I am her father. Then Dad dragged an extra chair over to our table, plopped down, and started babbling on. Then, when Luke wasn't looking, Dad poured pepper into his coffee. Before I could say anything, poor Luke took a sip and spat it out everywhere. Mm, sorry. I thought it was sugar. You see, I'm colorblind, so it was an honest mistake. After that, he accidentally splashed the sauce on Luke's shirt, then grabbed his glass of red wine and poured it over Luke, saying he was trying to clean it. Enough! Your old man is insane! No one will ever date you again! Then he stormed away. I was furious! How could Dad embarrass me like this? You're controlling, crazy, and do the stupidest things! You don't allow me to be me, and you just scared away my date! None of his apologies could move me. I had the right to make my own choices without dad interrupting and being ridiculous. So I used my savings and moved out of my home to start my new life. This freedom was greater than great. I could talk to any guy and go on as many dates as I wanted. Only, I know there's always were extra eyes on me. Do you get the feeling someone's watching us? No way, it's just you and me. I've had a great time. Do you want to do it again? Ugh! What the fudge? If Dad thinks he can stop me by messing around like this, he's totally wrong. It did quite the opposite instead. I started dating loads of guys, even if I didn't like them that much. It was so nice being spoiled by boys, and my room was always full of their presence. I updated Ben all about my dating stories, but he just frowned. Yo, slow down. You want to speed date the entire town? Man, it's just dating. It's not like I've agreed to be their girlfriend or anything. But you don't even know them, or what their intentions are. My dad doesn't understand me. Why now you sound just like him? Fine, don't feel like you need to come here or give me rides or anything. I can make my own way to school and get my date to come with me to practice from tomorrow. I'm sorry, Doris. Ignore me. I'm probably just overthinking stuff. Yeah, Ben's Ben. <sighs> He's still the one I could count on after all. Anyway, being a serial dater can cause troubles. I muddled up Gregory's interest with Ivan's. And I forgot I already told Anton my hilarious story the third time already. I was late for my date with Hector because my previous shift with Ryan went on longer than I expected. Then being so exhausted from all of this dating, I fell asleep during my meal with Christian. Luckily for me, Ben was always there to help. What's up? You look exhausted. I don't know. Dating was fun at first, but now it left me no time to rest, and now I can't even distinguish those guys. <laughs> hey, what's so funny? Nothing. It's just nice not having to share you with an alphabet of guys. Don't worry. You're the only bee in my life. One day after school, a group of boys surrounded me and started accusing me of being a cheater. Hey, it wasn't like I was anyone's girlfriend, so it wasn't classed as cheating. I'm still single, so I can go on many dates as I can. Only, my outburst seemed to make them even angrier. As all these guys shouted at me, a cop walked over. Hang on, is that dad? Hey, hey, you boys stop bothering this young lady right now. I just finished a karate course already. I'll give you a piece of my mind. See? Hiya! Hiya! What a bunch of weirdos. Thank God, Dad came here on time to save me. But it's such a shame that he saw I was a helpless failure at everything. So my shame became rage. Who asked you to show up in magazine? Quit bugging me with all your nonsense. I can handle this myself. 
When I returned to my apartment, Ben was sitting there waiting for me. Overwhelmed with everything, I burst into tears. He pulled me into an embrace and I instantly felt better. But then, Doris, stop with the games and just go home. Games? This isn't a game, this is my life. I deserve to live it how I want to. You're too much of a coward to ever understand that. As soon as I said it, I regretted it. Ben looked so hurt and mad. He just shook his head and left. I honestly thought he was the one person who would never leave. But whatever, I didn't need him or dad either. Now I had to prove to dad that I was mature enough to handle independence and could find someone much better than Ben beside me. Just wait and see. Told you, now God bless me with this guy, Mark, a super strong and macho BF who was always ready to protect me. Babe, look out. What? Just let me handle this. Then he moved me out of the way and punched right to the wall. Wow, that's a mosquito. Thank you for saving me. One time, we were strolling through the school's garden when I spotted Ben. I immediately gave Mark a cute damsel in distress look and said, Babe, I'm so tired. I think I'm gonna pass out. Don't worry, I'll take you to the hospital. Suddenly, he lifted me over his shoulders and carried me off. My head was spinning and it made me want to faint, literally. I begged him to put me down and let me sit for a while. Then, I suddenly saw Ben frowning at me. Ha, huh, seeing me totally fine without him, how can he not be annoyed? But who was that? She started staring at his art passionately. Then, can you believe it? She asked him to draw her, and he agreed. I can't stay here watching this ridiculous play. So I grabbed Mark's hand and pulled him away. But that night, I kept tossing and turning, and the image of Ben and that girl couldn't get out of my head. No, no, no big deal. They were just super irritating, that's all. Too many things happened, and now it's time for me to focus on my figure skating dreams again. With my sugar plum, as he went off to buy us some drinks, who should come over to me but my first date disaster, Luke? Oh, you're still ice skating. Just give up already. I only give you a high score so you date me. Don't flatter yourself. By the way, your crazy old man's still doing good? Shut up. My dad was right about you, you jerk. Jerk? Okay, this jerk will tell the rink manager to ban you from coming here for good. I stared at him, open mouth, not knowing what to say, when out of nowhere Ben appeared. I don't think the skating committee would be impressed by your fake scores, do you? All it would take is one email and you can kiss your position on the judging panel goodbye. How dare you? Then he left in anger. Right at that moment, Mark returned. Babe, skating sucks, just quit it. Let's go for some trampoline then. Dars, go practice. No one dares to ban you now. Who the freak are you? Mark, stop! That's Ben, my friend. Uh, no, just an acquaintance. Dars, watch yourself with that guy. It's none of your business. Let's go, Mark. Bye, loser. The next day at school, I saw Ben with that girl again. My heart thumped in sadness, and I don't even know why. Maybe I was so used to having Ben around me, and honestly, I missed him a lot. Mark soon followed my gaze over to Ben. Isn't that the dude from the ice rink? Why are you gawping at him? He was lunging toward Ben right after. I grabbed his arm trying to stop him, but he pulled me away instead to a corner. You are my girl. Remember that. In front of me was a total stranger, not the normal Mark I know. He was supposed to protect me, but now all I felt was scared. I couldn't move. Mark leaned over to kiss me and I immediately blocked him. What? How dare you? Oh no, I'm screwed. Ah, uh, terrorizing your own girlfriend, I see. Nice. Ben? Right on time. You're so done with me. Then Mark grabbed a flower pot and charged at Ben, but I panickedly pushed him over before he could do anything with it. He stumbled about, mumbling something, when Ben's fist came out of nowhere. You, you, you want another punch? Mark waved his fist at him, but then turned around and hurried off. I stared at Ben. I couldn't believe my eyes. He was strong and protective, totally different from the soft Ben I knew all this time. Doris, I think it's time for you to go home. Have you ever wondered why your dad really did that? I, I... Ben was right, and the day's drama made me realize how much I missed Dad. I wonder how he was doing. I arrived back to find Dad sitting all alone, dozing off, amid a pile of mess. He was in stained clothes, and on the easel was an unfinished picture of me. With tear-stained eyes, I ran to him and held him tight. I'm so sorry for leaving. I thought I would be okay by myself, but I'm definitely not. I miss you. You're back. I miss you too, darling. I felt so bad for upsetting Dad. When I calmed down, we talked through our problems. Sweetie, I know, it's just hard. You're all I have left. I just worry you're too young to make the right decision and can't bear seeing these idiots hurt you. But dad, I need experience to learn and grow too. Support me, will you? Um, 
Of course. I always wish you can find a kind man who understands, supports you, and is always by your side, and makes you truly happy. All those qualities reminded me of someone. I kept chasing after trivial things out there, thus forgetting the one who was standing by me all the time. So I immediately went to find him. Hey, Ben. Oh, hey. You'll be pleased to know I've moved back in with Dad. Yeah, that is good news. Look, Ben, I'm sorry. I've been an idiot. I took you for granted, and now I feel very bad for this. I, um, was wondering if you'll take me to practice tomorrow? I'll think about it. And I didn't expect to see you confronting a tough guy like Mark. You're not just a timid arty type, are you? Who says I'm timid? I'm only like that when I'm with you, because it makes you happy. I'm actually fully capable of looking after myself. And, um, you. I was sound asleep when loud bangings jolted me awake. The cops busted in and immediately pinned me down. What are you doing? Let me go! Get away from me! Do you even know who I am? Rebecca Darlington, you're under arrest for stealing Mr. Woodley Jones's heirloom necklace. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Stealing? What? No, I didn't do it. Let me go. Man, I got into big trouble that time. Oh, hey guys, I'm Rebecca. Believe it or not, it's actually my bizarre life story here. Before we start, please like and subscribe. My dad passed away when I was only five, so my mom had to step up and take over the entire family business on her own. And she was the biggest perfectionist on the planet, not just in business, but in the family too. Seriously, it's her way or no way. I hated this and always tried to rebel. However, mom always found a way to ruin my fun and forced me to study business instead. Ah, <sighs> boring. But lucky me, my brother, Kevin, always got my back. One morning over breakfast, mom decided to drop a bombshell on me. Rebecca, I've arranged you a date with Brian, the Woodley Jones's son. You are to go there for dinner and be on your best behavior. They are very affluent. They own half of the city. No chance. I'm not some pawn in your bid to gain business deals. If you ignore my orders, I'll transfer you to a boarding school all the way to Australia. You wouldn't. Don't test me, young lady. Perhaps you could arrange this date for another time when Rebecca has a time to digest it? If I wanted your input, I would have asked for it. He's my brother, and he has a say in this. Your adopted brother. It's about time he knows his place. Kevin looked so hurt, but still put a smile on for me. He's such an angel, just like his mom, Rosalie. Rosalie used to work here as a maid, and Kevin would often come play with me. But then she suddenly passed away, leaving Kevin all alone in this world. So mom adopted him out of pity. To me, Kevin's always been a family, and I will not let mom treat him like that. How about I let her have a taste of her own medicine? So I took mom's magic money card and went on a huge shopping splurge. Mom wouldn't be mad if her card missed a few zeros, right? Now let's get ready for the date. Ta-da! I look crazy, right? Take that, mom. No way will this Brian guy want a second date. Kevin kindly offered to drive me to my date. He reassured me it would be okay, then passed me a box of chocolates to give to Brian. Ugh, oh, Kevin. It was gone 9 p.m. when I strolled into the grand entrance hall of the Woodley Joneses mansion. Brian's jaw dropped to the floor as soon as he saw my crazy look. Oh, but I didn't stop there. I first asked all the surfers to leave us alone, then made him nauseous with my table manners, and wowed him with my big appetite. I even sneaked bites of the chocolates meant for him and playfully fed him some. After dinner, I asked him to give me a tour of the mansion. But by the time we reached the jewelry room, my head was spinning. Then everything went blurry, and I blacked out. The next morning, I was already back at my house without any memories of how I got back. Then these cops came in and arrested me. Now I'm in this interrogation room being accused of stealing the Woodley Jones necklace. Apparently, it was quite pricey and had been handed down through 12 generations. You were at the scene of the crime. If you want to prove your innocence, then I suggest you start telling me what happened. Like I said, I went there for dinner, then fainted, and somehow woke up in my bed with cops everywhere. Stop lying. Brian was the one who was drugged, during which time you cut off the power so you wouldn't be caught on CCTV, then stole the necklace, didn't you? Okay, Mr. Policeman. Daniel Wright, I know you're trying to play good cop, bad cop with me, so I'll get to the point. Let me go, and I will ask my mom to pay you handsomely. You know her, right? Head of the Darlington conglomerate? Are you trying to bribe to law enforcement? You could get seven years in jail for this, plus the robbery sentence. I can assure you it wouldn't be less than ten years. T ten years? 
I I didn't mean to. I just freaked out. I, I'm rich, okay? I have everything I want. I, I wouldn't risk stealing something like that. You did send all the staff home, so there was no one to corroborate your story. How exactly did you get home? I told you I blacked out. All I know is I didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't find the necklace at my place or on me either. You have no evidence against me. Then enjoy a stay in a cell for 24 hours, in which time I shall find the proof I need to lock you away for a very long time. Wait, no, please trust me. Someone, anyone. This was so unfair. I just wanted to go home. Fortunately, that cop couldn't find any proof and had to let me go. Finally, after 24 hours behind cold bars, unjustly accused, all I need right now is a warm welcome from mom and Kevin and a nice bath. But what I got was a slap in the face. How could you steal from the Woodley Joneses? Now they'll never do business with me again. Mom, I didn't do it. Why does nobody believe me? Would you look at yourself? Have you done anything good for this family? All you ever did was party, throw my hard-earned money out the window, then dare to cross me. You're no daughter of mine. Get out, now! I was shocked and heartbroken by her words. My own mother wouldn't believe me? So, I walked out. Just you wait, Mom. I'll prove it to you. I'm no thief. With Kevin's help, I rented a place not too far from home, but it was nowhere near the luxury I was used to. No worries. Once I proved myself innocent, things would get better. Now I just had to find that police guy, Daniel, that arrested me. He must have insight on the case, right? But when I arrived at the police station, I saw Daniel being scolded by his boss. You couldn't even solve the simplest case. Daniel, what has gotten into you? You're off the case. Jack, it's over to you. Leave it with me, sir. I won't let you down, like some incompetence. <laughs> Sheesh, that Jack guy was such a douchebag. And Daniel sure did look glum about all of this. So I approached him and suggested we work together to find the culprit and kick Jack in the butt. At first, he refused, as apparently a suspect participating in the investigation was not procedure. Relax, it's not like I want access to classified documents or anything. Think of it as working with a suspect. If we cooperate, you can monitor me to see if I really am the culprit. It's a win-win. It's not like that. I'm no longer on the case. Jeez, I didn't expect you to give up so easily. So much for being a pro. Maybe your boss was right to reassign the case. <laughs> Who are you to judge me? You're still the number one suspect in this case, and I got my eyes on you, thief. So, is that a yes? Ugh, fine. Bingo. Surely there's no place better to hunt for clues than the crime scene, right? But Brian's mansion was locked down and had security everywhere. Luckily, Daniel told me he'd already studied the house's layout and knew that the only way to intrude without being noticed was through this door. Yes, folks, you heard it right. A dog door. The bar couldn't get any lower, could it? Just shut up. We sneaked through it and ended up in the staff kitchen. The main building has already been fully swept, as that's where we knew the main suspect was. The staff quarters weren't a focus point. Daniel launched into a CSI mode, checking the area for footprints, and I watched with fascination. He found a strange shoe print, which didn't belong to any of the staff, as they were required to wear uniform shoes. This type of shoe print is rare. This could be a big clue. I didn't want him to start accusing me again, so I wiggled my foot about. Ahem, <clears throat> it's obviously not my tiny size six feet. <laughs> I didn't say a thing about you. This obviously belonged to a man with size 12 feet. Is it your accomplice? Is he Bigfoot or something? Are you crazy? Who's accomplice, you madcap? Shush, are you trying to get us caught? Oopsie, just then, we heard running footsteps coming our way. Shoot, we gotta get out. The only escape is through this window. Again? Oh, what a burden. Daniel grabbed my hand, then we both jumped through the window. Smack, his shoe was right up my face. Ouch, get your dirty foot off me. I tried getting up and we ended up kissing. My my first kiss. Wait, what is that sound? I turned around to see two big dogs growling at us. We run on the count of three, okay? One, just run! We ran straight to the road and caught a taxi, leaving behind those vicious dogs. Uh, your hand, um. Oh, sorry, it was because of those dogs. Is being chased by dogs the in-trend? A few nights ago, I saw those exact two dogs chasing another man along this road. Daniel immediately asked the driver to show him his dashcam footage. It showed this tall, masked man in all black coming out of Brian's house. A shiver ran through me at the sight of him. There was something unsettlingly familiar. The next day, Daniel made me traipse into at least a dozen different shoe stores so he could ask the staff about the soul print we'd found last night, but no luck. 
The scorching sun was getting to me, so Daniel brought out this umbrella. Cute, huh? If only this big hole hadn't been directly above me. By lunchtime, I saw Daniel sweating in the heat, so I grabbed a tissue to wipe for him. The heat rose as we were so close, but once done, he was even more oily. <laughs> we were just like two peas in a pod. Later that day, we made it to this ancient shoe shop that said it was a Leighton, a brand that made customized handmade shoes. Wait, I've heard about that exclusive brand before, but... If someone could afford these shoes, why would they go out and about stealing? Daniel seemed to agree, and the investigation was at a dead end. The truth is, I had my suspicions about who the real thief was, so I went back to the crime scene to see if I could find any evidence. Daniel did say this dog door was the only other way in, so I searched around the area and spotted this shiny bracelet in a bush. Oh, I know who this belongs to. So, I've asked him to meet me here. I found your bracelet. Thank you so much. You know how important this is to me. The bracelet is a keepsake for my mom. She gave it to me before she passed away. I found it at Brian's house. The night you drove me to Brian's, did you go straight home afterward? Y yeah, of course. I've been on the investigation for a couple of days and found that the thief wore size 12 latent shoes. I gave you a pair for your birthday. The thief was also identified by a taxi driver's dash cam as a male, around 5 foot 10, the exact body figure of you. And now, this bracelet? The coincidences are stacking up. But I can't believe it. Not without your explanation. After all, you are my brother. Yes, it was me, but I had no other choice. I actually have a sister, a half-sister from my dad's side, and she's going through surgery. I really needed the money to pay her bills. I might look successful on the outside, but I work for your mom unpaid. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for all she's done for me, and I couldn't ask her for more, so I took the risk. Why didn't you tell me? I can help you. You were always embroiled in arguments with your mom, so I don't want to burden you further. And you only seem to need me when you're in trouble. That's true. Thinking back, we rarely talked. Even when we talked, it was always me complaining about mom to him without realizing mom has been the hardest on him. I hated what he did, but I knew he only did it to save his sister. And I felt terrible that I'd had Kevin's love and care all of these years, and she hadn't. Kevin, don't worry. Just leave it to me. The next day, Daniel came to see me and told me the police department had just found new evidence against me. The chocolates I'd given to Brian that night contained anesthetics. It all sounds very suspicious to me and may just change the direction of my investigation. Are you investigating me now? No, it's highly possible that the real culprit wanted to target you. I need your cooperation. We have to hurry before they blame it all on you. Who helped you prepare the present that day? No one. I bought them at the store. I felt awful lying to Daniel, but I couldn't let Kevin go down for this. Not when his sister needed him. It was time for me to put an end to this devastating chain of events. I went to the police station and confessed to stealing the necklace. They arrested me, and right at that moment, Daniel stepped in, surprised. Rebecca, what are you doing here? Let her go! What are you doing? We can't arrest her without evidence. Daniel, it's okay. I already confessed. What? That's nonsense. I insisted that I did it, and he had no choice but to let them arrest me. I know it's not that simple, Rebecca, and I'm going to prove it. Daniel was right. Everything was off about this trial. First, this Jack guy had somehow swapped all the evidence against Kevin to me, from my shoe prints on the staff kitchen to the recording from the taxi driver. Plus, the necklace was later found in Miss Rebecca Darlington's bedroom. It was never there in the first place. I wanted to speak up for myself, but that douchebag Jack shut me up. The judge was about to sentence me when Daniel kicked the door and barged in. Stop, Your Honor. I believe all the evidence presented to you was faked by him. The whole court bursted out in surprise. Turns out Daniel's boss had suspected Jack was a rotten apple, so he actually wanted to use this chance to expose him. He pretended to kick Daniel out of the case and appointed Jack instead to lure him into the trap. As predicted, after I confessed to the crime, Daniel followed Jack and saw that he was taking bribes from Kevin. Well paid. I'll fake the evidence. Rebecca will go down for this. Don't mess it up. It's tricky enough to get that brat to take the blame for me. He played me? There was no half-sister who's in the hospital? Ugh, don't look at me like that. My real mom only died because of your mom, Don Darlington. That woman flagrantly accused her of stealing. Mom was so distraught, she had a heart attack and and passed away. Don only adopted me out of guilt, and she treated me like garbage, making me run around for you. So I decided to take revenge, show them how being wrongly accused of something can ruin lives. But look where vengeance got him. He was a monster, and I really wondered, was it really worth it? In the end, both Jack and Kevin went to jail. 
Unfortunately, without Kevin as key personnel to help out with my family business, it went into turmoil. So I offered to help mom with it. You do that after everything I put you through. We're a family. I also felt bad for taking you and what you provide me for granted. I'm so ashamed of how I treated you. I've been cold, controlling, and unfair on you and Kevin. It's my fault he turned against us and sought revenge. Mom, it must have been hard for you running the business and caring for me and Kevin, especially without Dad. I forgive you and want to just put it behind us and start again. Now, I just had one last person to make amends with. Rebecca, I... I didn't think you'd ever want to see me again. I didn't. I was so mad, but then I realized that being that way was getting me nowhere. To forgive others means forgiving and liberating ourselves. I walked out of the prison feeling much more positive about it all and saw Daniel waiting for me. Say, we make a good team. What do you think about being my partner? Partner? For investigative purposes or for life? Hmm, how about both? Hi, I'm Celine, and I've called the St. Augustine Orphanage home since I was six, but I'm not actually an orphan. You see, my parents are special agents with secret identities. Sweetie, if one day someone suspicious asks you about your parents, run for your life. I was used to these fleeting, ghost-like visits from my parents. They often took turns sneaking in and out at night, spending the little time they had with me, and always came together for my birthday. And even though I didn't see them much, they taught me some awesome skills. By the age of 12, I was fluent in five languages, could play a variety of instruments, and do a butterfly kick on anyone who needed it. Despite living a secret life and not seeing my parents as much as I wanted, I still felt lucky that I had them both in my life. It's my 17th birthday, a day I should be super excited about. You see, my parents always visit me together on my birthday, but I've been waiting here for ages and there's no sign of them. This was the first year this had happened. I didn't like it one bit. Something was definitely up. The next day in church, we were singing hymns when I spotted this strange man in the crowd staring at me. My instinct were telling me something was up, so I eavesdropped on him talking to a nun. That girl with blonde hair. How exactly did her parents pass away? He asked about my parents. That meant my life was in real danger. I fled with all my survival skills right away. What really happened to my parents? Have their identities been revealed? I didn't dare to think about it. So I made sure no one was following me before going to the subway and looking for a baggage locker. This was where I needed to come in a run-for-my-life situation. I waited until nobody was around before I opened it with my key. Inside was some money, a dossier documenting a girl's life from childhood to old age, and a letter. Our darling Celine, we're very sorry that you didn't have the normal childhood you deserved. Please don't ever doubt that we cherish and love you with all of our hearts. If you're reading this, it means our identities have been compromised. We've included the documents for your new identity. Stay strong. We will reunite soon. You're a loving mom and dad. XO. If my parents could arrange all this for me, I believe that they could handle anything and come back to me soon. So here I am, under my new identity, Diane. Australia, here I come. My parents left me just enough money to start a new life here, pay for rent and tuition fees. How perfectly ordinary. Diane's parents were researchers away in the Arctic. She's from a basic family and attended normal public schools, then worked as an office accountant, did not marry or have children. Everything was boringly safe. The thing is, if I was going to be someone else, then I should at least be someone fun. So I didn't start school. Instead, I created and adopted the identity of 20-year-old Harper and started my first money-making idea, Marriage on Demand. With all I'd learned from my parents, I could make a whole lot of money and at the same time experience how a normal family would look like. Perfect! First, I became a Harvard doctor graduate so this privileged guy's parents would give him his inheritance. Next, a posh aristocrat who saved my client from a dreadful arranged marriage. And then, a sweet-natured girl who helped my client intimidate their seriously mean friends. As soon as my clients achieved their goals, the contract ended and we went our separate ways. Before I knew it, through my Harper alias, I'd married nine guys in just eight months and become eye-wateringly rich. But as it turned out, the cases I took were all abnormal families. This 10th contract would be my final case. Then I'd say goodbye to Harper and attend college as Diane before I lost all faith in ever getting the family of my dreams. But while driving to my rendezvous, I swear that car was following me. It could be my parents or someone dangerous. Only one way to find out. Now I just had to wait. 
If they were dangerous, I'd drive straight off this cliff, then swim to safety. Then I saw this gormless, grinning guy peer through my window. He held up a temporary girlfriend contract. Hey, I just want to talk. Could he be my 10th client? Either way, he seemed harmless, so I stepped out of the car. I'm Carlton from the courthouse. You've sure been busy, so I've been assigned to investigate you. As far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to marry multiple times, is it? No, only if they're real and not marriage contracts. Carlton, I only have one client left and I'm not marrying him. I'm his temporary girlfriend, which I believe is legal. So, is there any chance you could turn a blind eye this one last time? Legal or not, I strongly advise you to quit this job and do something more morally upright. Just then, a black car pulled over and a man walked straight towards us. Oh no, had they found me? I'm sorry for getting you into trouble. I turned around, ready to jump, but Carlton suddenly held my hand back. No need for that. My boss won't eat you alive. Besides, I haven't told anyone about the contracts yet. Oh, so this man's his boss from the court? Turns out he and his wife happened to see Carlton on their way to the airport and just came to say hi. Hey, Carl, it doesn't say much if this girl would rather jump into the sea than date you. He looked really awkward and I felt bad for the guy. Without thinking it through, I clung onto his arm and gave him my best adoring look. Actually, we're deeply in love. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but you know Carl, he's just so strict about things like this. You're right, Carl is rather stiff. If you loosened up a bit, you may have been promoted by now. After they left, I explained to Carlton that's what my job is, helping nice guys out of unnecessary trouble. Nothing immoral about it. I was about to leave when he suddenly stopped me. I could see his attitude changed. Please, make a contract with me. I know you could help me improve my communication skills and get me promoted. You can see how desperate I am right now. I wasn't sure. I mean, number 10 was meant to be my last client, but just look at that clueless face. Fine, but in return, you must be an attentive boyfriend, and I want to have dinner with you and your family every evening. Carl looked a bit confused, but he agreed to my demands. Ugh, this was probably my last chance to experience a family life. I have a strict don't be wife two people at the same time rule, so I'm meeting my other client to gently turn him down. Celine, is that you? S Celine, he knew my name? OMG, that's Matten, the genius pianist from the orphanage. Oh no, this was terrible. He could blow my cover. I, um, I was adopted and go by Harper now. My adoptive parents turned out to be a letdown. I had to fake my identity so I could work on my own. I understand. It's so hard for orphans like us to survive. Yes, it sure is. Look, Matten, things got pretty difficult for me, so I had to take another job in a hurry. I can't do two jobs at once. I'm sorry I have to cancel our contract. Yeah, about that. I already publicly announced I have a girlfriend just a second ago. Pianist prodigy Matten confirmed he's currently dating someone? Matten, I really can't do this. Just tell me who your client is. I can make a deal with him. I can't be with them both, so I called an emergency meeting for them to plead their cases. An article accused me of inappropriate behavior towards female artists. It's completely false, of course. I need a girlfriend to distract the public and make them see I'm not a jerk. I want this promotion. If you won't help me, I'll expose you publicly. Pfft, like that matters. I'll just take you back to the US. No, I can't go back there, and I don't want any attention from people either. This is what I'm gonna do, Carl. I'll be your girlfriend on weekdays and do anything I can to help you get promoted. In Matin, I'll be your girlfriend, well, pretend to be your girlfriend on the weekend. But my face has to stay out of the media, okay? Once this is done, then it's goodbye Harper and hello, trouble-free, simple Diane. All I have to do is play some music while Matten listens and lets the paparazzi snap photos. I've always admired the way you play music. It follows no rules, but that's what makes it so fearless and fun. His comment made me pine for my parents. They were the reason I played like that. They taught me in the dark, told me to flow with the rhythms without any rules. I miss them so much. I must admit I'd always had a crush on you. When this is over, I want to protect you. I want to be your family. This was sweet, but he didn't know that I already had a family. I just needed to be patient. Then eventually, they'll be back. On weekdays, I joined Carlton for lunch at work and helped him talk to his co-workers and grumpy boss. Then in the evening, I went to his house and gave him tips on how to be more charismatic, make people trust and warm up to him. I also taught him how to walk without slouching and politely greet people. Hi, Mr. Chair. You look great today. Oh, Miss Lamp, are you okay? You shouldn't lose more weight. You're already gorgeous. Isn't that too much? I've never talked like this before. You're doing great. Carlton followed all my advice. He might be a bit clumsy, but in a cute, endearing way. 
Still, what I anticipated most was joining his family for dinner. I'd never experienced the cozy and warm atmosphere of a family dinner before. Who knew Carl was such a great cook? And so sweet! After only one week, Carl now had friends at work and his boss gave him extra responsibilities. Meanwhile, Matten's reputation also made a rebound thanks to articles like, he doesn't want to be around other girls because he's so passionately in love with this amazing muse. A frantic week quickly passed, which ended with Carlton's family celebrating his new position, all thanks to me. I was so moved I almost cried, but noticed Carlton seemed off. Maybe he was bummed out as he knew this was the end of our contract. After dinner, we went for a stroll around the garden. Then he blurted out, Who are you really? I was super surprised. Then he told me that one of his new jobs was to investigate a girl called Diane who entered the country, then vanished. I know you're Diane. I can recognize those eyes anywhere. Yes, I'm Diane, but I only faked my identity to earn money. I know you're lying again. It's fine, you've helped me, so I'll help you too. I faked some info to close the case. Thank you, Carl. This means a lot. I knew how important the laws were to him, but he still broke them. For me. I actually quit my job. What do you mean? What about your promotion? You've tried so hard for that. It's okay. I realized I didn't like it so much anyway. I felt terrible that he'd given up his job because of me. But he didn't need me anymore. Our contract had to end, right? Now it's time to end Matten's contract. Then I can go back to being Diane. However, I showed up at the villa to a swarm of reporters. Are you Matten's girlfriend? Please get out of the car. Are you the girl who dates him for dollars, not love? Please show yourself and verify the news. Looks like the news of Matten's girlfriend being a girl who only married for money had leaked. I sat there not knowing what to do. Then I saw Matten coming out of the villa hand in hand with some shiny haired girl. These rumors about my girlfriend are all lies. Amber is a wonderful, kind hearted soul and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I suppose that's pretty smart of him. Finding someone with a nice background was the only way to save his reputation for now. Goodbye, Matten. I wish you well. It seems he couldn't bring himself to ruin his career to protect me the way Carlton did. Now I was free to be Diane and attend this public school my parents wanted me to. Hmm, I was wondering when you'd show up. You're rather popular. A man with a scar has been asking about you. Someone with a scar was looking for Diane? The moment I realized someone was watching me behind the door, my instinct told me to run for my life. I rushed to the window and jumped down, just to catch Carlton peeping at me. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, so I tracked down Diane. I didn't expect to find you here, but I like you a lot, and there was no time. They saw us together, so I pulled him away. You're driving like crazy, Diane. Who are they? Why are they chasing us? I don't know. All I know is that they're dangerous. He took his phone out to call 911, but I stopped him. No cops. I can't trust anyone but myself, Carl. I'm so sorry for dragging you into this mess. My parents often told me the best way to escape a chase is to jump into the water. However crazy it seems, please trust me. I took a sudden turn and plunged the car straight into the sea. In the water, I unfastened the seatbelt and turned to see Carl already got out of his. He pulled my hand and we swam through the window. The waves drifted us onto a beach, but I had no strength left to move an inch. They're gonna catch us. Celine, sweetie, please wake up. I rubbed my eyes and saw the golden sand, Carlton, and my mom and dad? Am I dead? M mom? No, sweetie, you're very much alive. Turns out the people chasing us were my parents. After 10 years on the job, they finally eliminated the criminal gang and retired. Dad ended up getting the scar, but it's all over now. We could finally be a normal family. You sure made it hard for us to track you down by using a different identity. We should have known our cunning daughter would have created a more challenging life. Like father, like daughter. Huh? You're not Diane? Carlton, my name's Celine. Mom, Dad, this is Carlton, my boyfriend. It was so cute seeing him blush. Then he quickly held his hand out and introduced himself to them. It's lovely to meet you both. I care greatly for your daughter and I always will, no matter how mischievous she is. Turns out it's pretty amazing just being Celine. I started school as myself and so far, so good. I'm living with my kind, talented, and normal parents. We're having the best time together. And I get to date this cute, caring chef. The best part is I can finally stop running for my life and just enjoy the people I love most. Finally, I'm out of that morbid place. Now let me tell you, sharing a cell with a dozen other noisy, stinky, grumpy dudes ain't fun. Anyway, here I am. Free as a bird now. Hmm. 
so no one's here to pick me up. Suppose I'd have to call Mom. It took me a few seconds to familiarize myself with my phone. Jeez, it'd been four years. It was a miracle I hadn't turned into one of those leg-cradling crazy dudes. How I ended up in there in the first place was a joke. All I did was take some stuff from one or two warehouses and sell them on. No big deal. Yo, Mom, it's your boy, Cole. I'm out, and yeah, I need to lift home. I spoke the moment I heard Mom's voice. Cole, oh, I... Do you have any idea what hell your actions have put your mother through? My dad was so good at overreacting, but I needed somewhere to stay, so I could handle him. But dad, mom, come on, I'm still your son. You have the heart to see me homeless and sleeping next to rats? There was a brief pause. Then dad grunted, You can stay for a few weeks, but only for your mother's sake. Thanks, dad. You're the man. Bingo. My parents were like putty in my hands. This was the life. I played video games all day, then partied all night. Then one night, I was getting ready to meet my friend Moose, when Mom told me that the pizza delivery guy was at the door. I shouted down to her, You can shout me this one, and I'll get the next. I finished getting ready, and I must say, I was looking smooth. I strode down into the kitchen and grabbed a slice of pizza. Dad was sitting there glaring at me over his report. If you can't afford to pay for items, then I suggest you don't order them. He looked at the pizza slice in my hand. Mom walked up behind him and placed her hands on his shoulders. Darling, give him some more time. He's still adjusting to outside life. Thanks, Mom. You're the greatest. I gave her a greasy pizza kiss on the cheek. Um, any chance you can lend me some dough? Dad shook his head and sighed while Mom went over to her purse and passed me some money. Hey, there'd be plenty of time to get a job and be responsible. Right now, I had four years of lost time to make up for. Once, I borrowed Dad's car. I swear I only had a couple of beers, but the world glitched out and went all blurry. The next thing I know, I'd driven straight into the neighbor's front yard. Oops. I opened my eyes the next morning to a killer headache. So all I wanted was some black coffee and a plate full of bacon. But I got Dad's death stare instead. Just when I think you can't get any more irresponsible, you took my car without asking, drank too much, then drove into Gloria's beloved rose bushes. Chill out, Dad. I'll fix it later, I said as I raided the fridge for food. You're not the one having to pay for the damages. We've made our decision. You have one week to get out of our house. Now hold up. I had zero places to go. I couldn't stay with Moose as he was crashing in his sister's garage and I didn't know anyone else. How could they? Ugh, sc I gotta chill a bit. So I pulled out my phone and started scrolling through dating apps. Then I matched with this stunning blonde called Trudy. She's a little older than me, but her family is rolling in dough, and also, she has her own business. Not only that, but she's hotter than an agitated dragon. So yeah, her photos seemed a little grainy, but guess the retro trend was in. Looks like I had it both ways. Love, and money. I have quite a face, but since I love beer and pizza, and without any dedication for the gym, I don't have the perfect body, but I needed to keep this girl interested. So I told her I was a tall dude with an impressive six-pack, who just graduated and was on the lookout for a girl with brains as well as beauty. This girl was actually pretty easy to talk to. She sent me pictures of her latest purchases, like phones, expensive watches, and designer clothes, along with the promise that when we started dating in person, she'd buy me whatever I wanted. Result. After four days of face pics and my priceless conversation, Trudy was smitten, and she sent me a message saying, Cole, I haven't known you long, but I know how I feel. I love you. X. Okay, that's really fast, but yeah, I've won the lottery over here. Hey, maybe she lied about her look too, but it didn't matter. She's rich. So I replied to her, I know, babes, I feel it too. X, we immediately arranged to meet in person and decided on a yellow dress code. I looked around the park trying to spot this gold mine, but all I could see was some old lady in a yellow dress. Okay, coincident, but why is she heading my way? The closer she got toward me, the wider her grin was. Cole, right? It's me, Trudy. What? No, 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 no. How come this corny, overweight, wrinkly old lady be Trudy? 
I was expecting the blonde beauty from the photos, not Big Bird. Once I got over the initial shock, we sat down and talked. Turns out my dream girl was in her 50s. All the descriptions and photos of her were true, but 30 years ago. She was clearly in the middle of a midlife crisis or something. You're not the same either, she sneered. You're barely taller than me. And where's the gym body? All right, fair enough. I fake smiled. Yeah, despite you looking different, I still find you very beautiful. That night, I tossed and turned. This was all so unexpected. Trudy was totally not my type. But dating her might not hurt. She was rich. And also, I had to move out tomorrow. So at least she'd pay for me. With that, I sent her a message. Babe, you're beautiful, and I want to make us official. X. The next day, I moved in with Trudy. Now, let me tell you something. Her apartment was lavish. It was full of the latest tech. Crazy. Seeing as she was so old, she probably didn't know how to use them. She worked a lot, so most of the time I was home alone. And I was free to watch cartoons and movies, munch on potato chips, and play as many video games as I felt like. One time, I was watching a movie when the door opened. And in stepped this glary-eyed dude. I shouted at him, Hey, dude! You have the wrong apartment! He tutted and said, I can assure you that I don't. I'm Alex, Trudy's son, and you must be Cole. I would say it's a pleasure to meet my mother's gold-digging boyfriend in the flesh, but unfortunately, it's not. What? Trudy has a son? And by the looks, he's even older than me. And how dare he called me a gold-digger? I suppose I was, but still, he had no right to call me it. Even worse, he refused to leave. He just sat in the kitchen and waited for his mom to return. Then he had a heated argument with her in which he referred to me as a loser and a bum. Things weren't any better with my parents either. Dad told me to be independent and get a real job, not a sugar mama. And mom was just crying. Psh, whatever. This was their fault for kicking me out in the first place. What did they expect me to do? Live under a bridge? Few days after I met Alex, Trudy insisted on dragging me along to his lame work launch thing. As soon as I got there, I went straight to the food. I was stuffing a mini quiche into my mouth when this girl walked up alongside me and said, <laughs> Great minds think alike. I gave her a gormless look. Then she pointed at the food. We both headed straight for the food. I laughed at that. <laughs> this girl was funny. And hot. Really hot. Her name is Beatrice, and she works for that loser, Alex. After that, I started seeing a lot more of this Beatrice girl, as she often popped over with Alex. And while he was arguing with his mom, usually about me, I chatted to her. That was how I found out she wasn't having it easy either. She was behind on her rent because her truant brother had stolen the money and spent it all. I felt bad for her. So I took the envelope full of cash that Trudy had given to me, and I handed it to her. Okay, so I wouldn't be able to buy anything new for a few weeks, but it was worth it just to know that she'd be okay. Truth was, I was really falling for Beatrice, but I couldn't do anything about it, as I was with Trudy, and I was relying on her handouts. Soon, things became stinky. I came out of the shower to see Trudy standing there with my phone in her hand. How could you? She threw it at me. Yeah, so she'd read all of the messages I'd sent to Moose, saying how I didn't find her remotely attractive and I was only with her for a free ride. Trudes, my babes, come on, those messages were just me joking, I laughed. I was just messing around. Shut up, you liar. You find me hideous. Alex was right. You were only using me for my money. And worse, you never went to college. Instead, you were in jail. I was about to lay on the coal charm when Alex and Beatrice bursted into the room. Alex shouted at me, How low life you are. What a shameless gold digger. <laughs> it's appalling. I've told her to report you to the cops. Beatrice interrupted. No, don't do that. What Cole did was wrong, but he's not all that bad. Please. I was so moved. Took a look around. Trudy was crying. Alex was so furious his eyes were bulging. And Beatrice, well, she just looked disappointed. I then packed my stuff and left in shame. Well, that was a few months ago, and I have a decent job now. Even though I live back at home, I pay my way and I'm saving up to put a deposit down on my own place. I never should have used Trudy like that. She might be old, but she still has feelings, and the way I treated her wasn't right. 
I was undeniably a douchebag back then. All I want is to have a happy life with Beatrice. I really love her. Which is why I asked her to be my girlfriend, but she rejected me. Man, it's stung, but I'm not giving up. Perhaps she might give me a chance once she sees I've changed. I can't fix the past. All I can do now is improve myself and keep on rolling forward. My best friend Tasman is the most popular girl in school. You know the type. Pretty, rich family, the kind of girl who has everything. I guess some would say she's a spoiled brat. I mean, she's pretty nasty to people, and her mood swings are so unpredictable. Plus, she likes to pick on everyone. But luckily for me, we've been friends since we were little, so I knew she'd never treat me as badly as the other kids. But she didn't exactly treat me nicely either. In fact, most of the time, I felt like her maid. But there were good days too, where she was the greatest friend ever buying me stuff, and even taking me to her fancy country club on the weekends. But when she got cranky, oh my god, I bore the brunt of it. She'd yell at me and complain about every little thing I did, and then she'd order me around. I was like her little stress ball or something. One time, she realized her gym clothes were wet, so she made me swap with her, so she could wear my dry ones. It looked like I'd peed my pants, and everyone laughed at me. She didn't even stick up for me. It was like she used me so she could shine even more. Whenever we hung out with boys, she'd drag me along, but didn't let me know beforehand, so I'd show up looking sloppy, and by that way, she'd look amazing next to me. She clearly didn't want me to get any attention. One day, I put makeup on, and she said I looked like a clown. And then there was the time she wanted to date this guy, but he would only date her if she brought a friend for his brother. So she brought me, and oh my god, his brother was such a weirdo. It was awful. I could handle her, though. And compared to the other kids at school, who had it much worse, I was okay. I felt bad for them, and wished I could stand up to her and protect them, but I wasn't brave enough. To be honest, it wasn't just because I didn't have the courage to stand up to her, it was also because there were way too many advantages of being her friend. She was always generous and gave me all her old clothes, even if she'd only worn them once. She had this super cute skirt, but then she saw another girl wearing it and immediately gave it to me. She gave me a brand new pair of high heels that she said made her legs look fat. Honestly, most of my pretty clothes and shoes came from her, and she always brought me gifts back from her family's luxury vacations. But despite all this, I couldn't ignore the slight resentment I felt towards her. And, okay, there's a bigger reason why I put up with how unfairly she treated me. You see, Tasman has a twin brother called Trevor, and I had a major crush on him! Hanging out with Tasman meant I got to see Trevor more often. Compared to his sister, Trevor was so chilled, but sometimes he was quite cold, even slightly mysterious. So that's why they didn't really get along. Tasman always said mean things about him behind his back. Things like how he was just so lame and such a grandpa. But one time, I almost messed things up while hanging out at their house. Trevor was chilling and playing guitar out on the patio by himself, so I pretended to wander around then approached and complimented him. But Tasman caught sight of that while looking out from the kitchen. Afterwards, she grabbed me and said, Hey, what was that? Did you just flirt with my brother? Ew, uh, do you have some kind of crush on him? Don't you dare. If you do, then our friendship is over right now. I was so shocked at how she reacted, so I quickly denied it and said, Ew, come on, your brother is gross. I hoped she couldn't tell I was lying. After that incident, I told Tasman I had to go home, as I had some crafts to finish. She just burst out laughing and said crafting was for losers. It really upset me, though, because I loved doing DIY stuff, and my cousins and the kids next door had asked me to start teaching them how to do it. My one cousin had even persuaded me to start making videos on it. So even though Tasman thought it was totally uncool, I still went ahead and secretly started a YouTube channel to share my DIY tutorial videos. The kids on my street all loved it, 
and pretty soon, I had quite a few subscribers. Then I took it a step further and made hand puppets of some popular cartoon characters and started doing puppet show videos. Slowly but surely, my channel started to pick up speed. There was one viewer with an account called Cherry Pie that was always the first to leave a comment. She'd even DM'd me on my channel's Twitter account and we started talking almost every day after that. One day, I decided to make a video to properly introduce myself to my channel's viewers, but I was too shy to show my face, so I did it with the puppets instead. The audience seemed to be more interested when I talked about my own life, and so I started telling them about my family and friends, and of course, that included Tasman. But I changed everyone's names to fun nicknames and changed my voice a bit so no one would recognize me. I started to talk a lot about Tasman and how she tortured me and the other kids. I gave her a horrible voice that sounded like a monster and even showed how she would laugh at what people were wearing. I got so into it that I started to make stuff up, like saying how she stole other kids' lunch money, made them do homework for her, and made them buy her snacks during each recess. She always acted like she was some kind of queen. I realized how many feelings I'd buried deep inside me over the years, and now I had this creative outlet to release them all. I even shared the story of when Tasman got dumped by her ex-boyfriend and how she tried to get him back and turned up on his doorstep. He was with his new girlfriend, and she started clinging to his ankle, begging him to ask her out again. Tasman would die if she knew I'd shared this, but I couldn't stop myself. After uploading that video, I gained so many views and subscribers, it seemed like people could really relate to these stories of mine. But weirdly, my number one fan, Cherry Pie, disappeared. I really missed her, to be honest. A few days later at school, everyone was whispering about my channel, and it quickly became clear that they knew about my videos. How had they found out? But then, to my complete horror, I realized they could see my school uniform in one of the videos, and everyone realized the villain I was talking about was Tasman. She was furious about it and said she was going to find out which of these losers had done it and make their life hell. I was so terrified, I set all my videos to private and even took a few days off school as I felt so worried about what would happen if she discovered it had been me. Then one day, Cherry Pie suddenly DM'd me again. I thought she was going to ask about where the videos had gone, but instead she said, Looks like you got what you wished for. Everyone's talking about your channel, and now you're finally in the limelight. Oh. My. God. Did this girl also go to our school? Who was she? It couldn't be Tasman. Could it? I replied with like a hundred questions, asking who she was. Did she know who I was? How did she find me, and what did she want? But I got no reply. But then, a few hours later, I got a message saying, Come outside. What? How creepy! I started to feel scared that maybe I had a stalker or something. I grabbed my pepper spray and headed outside, but instead of some crazy fangirl, Trevor was standing there. Hang on, Trevor is Cherry Pie? He said he'd found out about my channel because one time at their house, I'd been reading the comments on my phone, and he'd passed behind me and caught sight of the name of the channel. He became curious, so he made a fake account so he could watch my videos, and that's when he developed a crush on me and enjoyed watching them regularly. Well, that was until I mentioned his sister and made up all those fake stories about things she'd done. That's how Tasman found out about the videos. She borrowed Trevor's laptop one day and saw it open on his screen, but at least the only person who knows it's my channel is Trevor. He said he was really disappointed in me and thought I was better than that. Then he said he was going to delete his fake account because he didn't want to be a phony liar like me. I was heartbroken. How could I have been such a terrible person? I don't know what to do. Should I confess to Tasman that it was me and apologize to her and Trevor and hope they'll forgive me? Or should I just keep quiet and instead focus on being able to stand up for myself and tell Tasman that it's not okay to pick on people? Being the awesome class president that I am means that it's my job to show this new transfer student, Willow, what's what around here. So, obviously this is the canteen. Heads up, don't eat the stew. Yuck. If you have any trouble finding something, just ask me. Well, 
I haven't seen you since middle school. What's up? Um, just still the same. Um, okay. Oh, you must be confused, but actually, I already know Willow. You see, we went to the same middle school together, but to be honest, we never really talked to each other back then. She seems to still be as quiet as always. Oh, and by the way, I'm Natalie, but you can call me Nat. The next few days, I saw Willow always sitting in a corner of the classroom and doodling. She looked kind of lonely, so being a nice person, I decided to sit and talk to her. Hey, Willow. Nice shirt. She just gave me this weak smile, then continued doodling. Ugh, talk about awkward. The best thing I could do was just to stupidly smile back, then swiftly left. I didn't really bother with Willow after that. I mean, I said hi if we passed in the hallway or something, but that was it. But it turns out Willow's introverted tendencies hadn't gone unnoticed by other students. As when we were on our school expedition to the woods, I overheard them talking about her. Do you all think that Willow seems a bit weird? Yeah, you're totally right. One time I asked to borrow her eraser, and she just gave it to me without saying anything. She didn't even look me in the eye, just kept on drawing. It was so strange. Huh? Are they seriously gossiping about a new kid? Yeah, so she might not be too sociable, but people should just learn how to respect someone's personal differences, right? Hey, Willow is new here. I don't think it's very nice of you to gossip like this. Also, she's my friend from middle school, so please stop this. But just wondering, has she always been like this? Um, yeah, I guess. Actually, I was quite surprised to see her in our class. In middle school, her grades weren't that good, so it's kind of odd that she's in the top set with us. I could see the whole group was looking at me with surprised eyes. But hey, that was a few years ago. Now, so maybe she's changed. I quickly corrected myself. Then, a few days later, I was standing by my locker when suddenly my best friend Layla appeared and gripped my shoulders. Oh my god, have you heard the news? Everybody is saying Willow only got into top set because her parents made a huge donation to the school. Can you believe that? What? Who's spreading this absurd rumor? I don't know, but someone's saying that she wasn't that smart in middle school. Oh my god. Was the rumor culprit me? It was me. I did it at the expedition. Oh no, I, I didn't mean to. Oh, how could I let this happen? Then when I entered class, I noticed a sobbing willow being comforted by some other students. I felt horrible. So I also went over to her and tried to cheer her up. Don't worry about it, willow. Everyone knows this rumor is a lie. Why would anyone do such a thing? I mean, I just transferred here. Who would hate me so much to say something so mean? Oh, man. I sure felt guilty. Oh, could things get any worse? Um, yeah. Turns out they can. As after class, Miss Holmes suddenly asked me and Willow to stay behind. Oh, no. Did she know I was the one who started the Willow rumor? I sat there, sweating like a turkey at Thanksgiving, waiting for Miss Holmes to bust me. But then, to my surprise, she said, Nat, please, can you help me get to the bottom of this horrible rumor? Phew, what a relief. But at the same time, I was freaking out. How was I supposed to catch the person responsible when I was the one who started the rumor? Albeit accidentally. Ugh, oh, what a dilemma. Wait a minute. I think I have an idea. What about I blame it on a troublemaker? It's not like they would care anyway. Whilst I'm a straight-A student, and getting into trouble for this could affect my chances to get into a prestigious college and ruin my life. Right at that moment, this guy called Bob shoved past us then leaned against the wall and scrolled through his phone. Bingo. Gotcha. I put one hand against the wall and gave him a suspicious look. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Um, fine. So, about this Willow rumor? Who did you hear it from? Bob just shrugged and continued staring at his phone. Or did you do it? Maybe you were bored. So you spread the rumor to tease the new girl. Am I right? Or what? Only by then, Bob looked at me. What? Are you crazy? I don't know this Willow girl. Besides, I was off all last week sick. Now leave me alone. Oh man, this was a massive fail. Now what should I do? I needed a minute to think. Okay, don't panic, Nat. You're smart, so you'll think of something. That's when I turned and caught a glimpse of Willow's sad face. Don't worry. I will find out who did it. I comforted her. But inside, I was screaming. I hated lying to her, but this was an accident. I never meant to spread that rumor. At that moment, Layla appeared and said she wanted to help. Great. 
like this quest wasn't complicated enough. Ugh. Layla told us that she heard the rumor from this nerd, Ben. So we all tracked him down and asked him. But he heard it from some other dude, and it went on and on until a girl said that she heard it from Ashley. That's when I remembered that Ashley was on the talking group in the expedition. Oh, no. I had to stop this encounter between us. So when they spotted Ashley, I started making weird noises and made out I had a stomachache. They were still going to her, so I had to scream loudly like I was in labor. In the medical room, I continued screaming as if I was in a lot of pain. The nurses diagnosed that it might be appendix pain, so I immediately needed to be transferred to the hospital. I instantly stopped screaming as soon as I heard that and said, it's just that time of the month. Phew, that was close. But at least I've successfully stopped them from investigating Ashley. Well, I spoke too soon, because right that second, Ashley walked into the medical room. But thank God she didn't mention me. Instead, she said Carl told her about it. Phew. To my luck, Carl was absent today, so the manhunt had to end here. It would unfortunately continue tomorrow, though. As we warily walked out of school, I glanced over at Willow and saw that she looked really down. Ugh, that made me feel so bad. So to make it up for her, I asked her if she wanted to grab a sandwich. My treat, of course. And she said yes. Mmm, that sandwich was so good. And Willow seemed to enjoy hers, too. It was great to see her happier, so I decided to extend our trip by going to the mall. Willow kept on glancing at this dress, but it was out of her price range, so being the awesome friend that I am, I bought it for her as a gift. Well, that's the least I can do after everything I'd done to her, right? But then I noticed something weird. When I was standing at the counter to pay for it, I turned around and saw her smirking. Then when she saw me looking at her, she immediately smiled and thanked me for the dress. Huh, so strange. The next day, the rumor scavenger hunt continued. Ugh. We cornered Carl and questioned him, but he couldn't remember where he heard it from. Layla asked him to think carefully, and he just shrugged and said he had no idea. Layla got suspicious, so she immediately reported him to the principal's office. I didn't even have a chance to stop her. The next thing I knew, we were being called out over the loudspeaker and summoned to go to the principal's office. Then Carl confessed that yesterday he got an anonymous message via Facebook saying that they were willing to pay him if he agreed not to tell the name of the person who told him the rumor. He showed us his phone, but all the messages and the user account didn't exist anymore. That's right. I was the anonymous user who contacted Carl yesterday. Thank God I deleted the messages and the account on time. But things weren't that simple. The principal decided to suspend Carl for withholding information. Finally! My plan worked! But why wasn't I feeling happy about it? On the contrary, I felt... Bad. Really, really bad. Blaming someone for my mistake wasn't right. I couldn't do that to Carl. So, I stood up and blurted out, It was me all along. I started the rumor, but it was an accident. Well, and that's it. Cue a two-week suspension. Now Willow is refusing to hear my apology, and everyone else thinks I'm some villain. Only Layla has stuck by my side and remained adamant there was more to the story. Then, a few days later, when I was trying to curb my boredom with potato chips and a Love is Blind marathon, Layla came by and told me the shocking news. There may be a chance that I wasn't the person who spread the rumor about Willow. The thing is, Layla continued asking around school and ended up with a girl named Rosa, who had a reputation for gossiping. Rosa told Layla that she was in the bathroom when suddenly a girl in the cabin next to her started telling her about the rumor. Rosa found it odd, so she bent down to see who it was, but the only thing she could see was a pair of pink Nike Air Force One. Then Layla asked me, You know who always wears those, right? I nodded. But, objectively, there could be other girls who own the same shoes, correct? Fortunately, Rosa also noticed an important detail that will help us close the case. The right shoe has a tear mark. I checked our suspect's shoes, and they match. <gasps> so we finally knew who really did it. We just needed a plan to trap them. The next day, we called Willow to meet us at a cafe and told her that we found the real culprit. But when Willow arrived, she immediately got mad and yelled at me. Stop blaming it on somebody else. Maybe the person heard you when you were speaking about me during the expedition trip. As soon as Willow said that, Layla and I immediately looked at each other and grinned. What's so funny? I never told you that I spread the rumor at the expedition. I didn't even tell the principal. I only confessed that I was the one who said it. That's all. Willow looked shocked. Then we told her about Rosa and how she saw Willow's shoes, so Willow couldn't deny it anymore. Okay, it was me. I've never liked you, and you think you're so perfect. So at the expedition, when I overheard you talking about me like that, 
It made me so mad that I came up with the idea to spread the rumor about myself and then blame it on you. So you'd look like a horrible person and I'd get people's sympathy. A genius plan, right? Oh my, oh my. Who would have thought that the victim herself was actually the one who did the crime? Layla got so mad that she immediately wanted to report Willow to the principal, but I stopped her. I realized that it was partly my fault too. If I hadn't told people anything about Willow, then this never would have happened. So, well, after that, Willow and I stopped talking to each other. Actually, if I see her in the hallway, I'll purposefully walk the other way. But anyway, thanks to this incident, I learned some valuable lessons. Never, ever gossip, as it's just not worth it. And also, choose your friends wisely. Hi, I'm Viola, and today is a big day. You see, it's my first time ever acting in this awesome short film, but I can't seem to focus at all. Why, you ask? Well, that's because I just discovered I'm not real. Or, to be exact, I only exist in my best friend's imagination. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Until yesterday, I always thought of myself as a completely normal human being. <sighs> Let me tell you how it all started. The first memory I have involves my best friend Harlow. I woke up feeling dazed and confused and saw this pretty girl smiling down at me. She told me that I'd be safe now and that her parents were going to look after me. Strangely, I couldn't remember anything before that day, and no one told me what had happened. I could only guess that I'd probably been abandoned or something, and that Harlow and her parents were my saviors. So, from then on, I lived with Harlow's family who showed me kindness and love. When I first got out of the hospital, I couldn't do anything by myself. From personal things like brushing my teeth and washing my face, to chores such as doing laundry and dumping the trash. At the time, it was Harlow who guided and helped me, like a caring big sister. Then, when we entered middle school and the boys started flirting with me, Harlow was always by my side to protect me. She told me how they would never like a plain, boring girl like me, and that they were only doing this to get close to her, as she was very beautiful. If I had a decision to make, big or small, I always consulted Harlow first, as I knew she'd know best. But recently, I noticed that Harlow was acting short-tempered with me. When I got a better grade on my English essay than her, she told me I only got that mark as the teacher just felt sorry for me. Then she stormed off. Man, I didn't mean to upset her, and it was really unfair that the teacher didn't give her the grade she deserved, as she's far smarter than I am. Then last week, this boy called Hank in our school's film club held open auditions for his short film project. Harlow was desperate to be in it, so I decided to go along with her for support. I thought Harlow's audition was marvelous, but for some reason, she wasn't picked. I was about to leave too, but then Hank asked me if I wanted to audition. So I did, and you know what? I got the lead role. I was so surprised, and so was Harlow. She insisted that they were just tricking me, and I shouldn't take the part, as why would they choose a girl with ordinary looks like me to play the female lead? But still, I wanted to give it a try. Opportunities like this don't come twice, right? So I accepted the part. I know Harlow was worried that they were just teasing me, but Hank and his crew seemed nice, and maybe he finds my normal looks suitable for the character, right? The morning before the shooting day, I asked Harlow to lend me her pretty white dress to wear to the shoot. Harlow looked annoyed as she said, You spilled coffee on that dress last time you borrowed it, remember? You didn't even bother taking care of it, and now the stain's still there. No way! I remember washing it before returning it to you. Well, then you remember it wrong. It's my dress, so I'm hardly going to forget what you did to it, am I? Then she left in a temper. Strange. I remember using vinegar to clean the coffee stains, as it took me ages to scrub it off. But it is true that my memory isn't all that good. When I was a child, I once waited in the park in the rain for over an hour, just because I thought Harlow told me to meet her there on Saturday afternoon. I said Sunday afternoon? I have piano practice today, silly. So, maybe I misremembered again, and really didn't wash the dress for her? That day in math class, Harlow got caught texting, so the teacher confiscated her phone. At break time, she asked me to sneak into the school administrator's room to get her phone back. 
but of course I refused as I was far too scared to do that kind of stuff. It's okay, no one can see you. Basically because you only exist in my imagination. What was she talking about? What did she mean by that? For the rest of the lesson, I kept thinking about Harlow's words. When the bell rang, seeing that I was still confused, Harlow pointed to a group of students standing nearby and told me that no matter what I did, they wouldn't see me. And that's true! When I waved my hands and talked to them, no one looked in my direction. I even snapped my fingers in front of them, but they didn't react at all. What is going on? Harlow told me that because she imagined me, she is in control of who sees me or not. Then she told me that if I still didn't believe it, I should go to the school administrator's room to get her phone. Then I'd see that she was telling the truth. The superintendent was standing right across the hallway, but Harlow assured me I'd be invisible to her. My heart was thudding like crazy, but I tried to shake back my nerves and continued to get her phone undetected. Whoa, the superintendent didn't see me at all! So what Harlow said was true? I only existed in her imagination? That means Harlow's really the one who decides what will happen to me. And who I'll meet? So basically the author of my life story. But does that also mean that I have no control over my own life? Well, if I even have a life. Then Harlow barged into my room and said, You've never wondered why you don't remember anything about your parents and about the time before you met me, have you? It was because I lost my memory after the accident. There was no accident, Viola. You have no previous memories because that was when I created you, as I wanted a friend to play with. I kept this truth a secret because I love you, and you always listen to me. But you've been so headstrong lately. After Harlow left, I found myself feeling so down. It turned out my whole life had never belonged to me. No wonder I was so plain and ordinary. All I am is a side character in Harlow's story. After a horrible sleepless night, I didn't even feel like going to the film set anymore. And it's already late anyway. I was laying in bed, spacing out, when Hank phoned me asking where I was. I only exist in Harlow's imagination, so there's no point filming. Huh? What nonsense are you going on about? Stop joking, Viola. We're short on time over here. Seeing that I didn't even bother to reply to him, but just let out a long sigh, he continued. All right then, if that's the case, then you should at least make it count. Would you like to imagine yourself as just a boring nobody or a brilliant actress? I suppose Hank's words made sense, so I got myself back together and hurried to the film set. Even if I'm imaginary, I'll make this unreal life of mine unimaginably awesome. The filming was actually a lot of fun, and everyone complimented my acting. Hmm, they were probably just being nice, but it still felt good. Then Hank came over and congratulated me. Now that filming's over, you can be honest with me. I don't mind. I know you only cast me as the lead as you like Harlow. What do you mean? And the thing you said this morning as well about only existing in Harlow's imagination? I ended up blurting out everything to him, and you know what he did? He laughed. But when he saw that I was struggling to fight back my tears, he took my hand. Viola, listen to me. Harlow's tricking you. The only thing not real in all of this are her words, not you. No way. Harlow's my best friend. She would never do such a thing. If you only existed in Harlow's imagination, how come you still decided, on your own, to show up at film set this morning? How come you still meet other people without her being around? Like, right now? Harlow couldn't have written the script with all these little details, right? Come on, Vi. Think about it. But there was a time when Harlow made me invisible to everybody else. I snapped my fingers in front of them, and they didn't react at all. Hank asked me who these people were, and I told him. He said he'd make sure I saw sense. Then he left. This was so confusing. I cannot tell what is real and what's not anymore. The next day at school, when I was sorting my locker out, Hank dragged a reluctant-looking boy over to me. I recognized him. He was part of the group who didn't see me. Go on. Tell her everything. 
The boy told me how Harlow had bribed them to trick me. He also said that they distracted the superintendent so I could sneak into her office without being caught. What? I didn't understand why Harlow would do this to me. Hank went with me to confront her, and she faked a smile and said, Silly Viola, it was just a joke. So what about the fact that I can't remember anything about the time before I met you? You said there was no accident. It's also a lie, isn't it? I never said that. Probably you misremembered again like so many times before. I view you as a sister, Viola. I'd never lie to you. I didn't know what to believe anymore. I needed to be alone for a minute. This was all too much to process. So I ran to the nearby park to clear my mind. Suddenly, I felt something cold next to my cheek. It was Hank. He passed me some water and told me to drink it and calm down. Viola, I think Harlow's gaslighting you. She's basically emotionally abusing you to make you question your own sanity. I know you see her as a sister, but she's really toxic. Could it? Could it be possible that Harlow didn't have my best interests at heart? But what did she even get out of this, though? I'm not sure if this was because she wanted me to rely on her or she's jealous, but either way, knowing she could deceive me like that hurt like crazy. I didn't want to believe that that was what had been happening, but after all explanations, it's so clear now that Harlow was gaslighting me. And ever since then, I tried to avoid her as much as possible. But this was tricky, seeing as we were in the same class and lived together. I just wished I could grow up fast so I could go to college and leave this house. At least there was good news. Hank's film in which I starred had gained attention on YouTube, and he was even selected to attend the short film festival with a view to supporting the city's young, talented filmmakers. Then, one day, I arrived home from school to see Harlow's parents drinking coffee with a strange woman. Huh? She sure looked a lot like me. Suddenly, she was running over to me and hugging me in her arms. Oh, darling, you have no idea how long I've been waiting for this moment. Following a whole lot of confusion, shocking revelations, and emotions, I finally found out the actual truth. It turned out that when I was seven years old, Mom took me on a yacht trip. Only, there was a terrible accident, so we took the lifeboat to shore. But then Mom fell out and ended up being rescued by another boat. We both suffered memory loss. In fact, Mom only remembered who I was when she saw the short film I starred in on YouTube. And then she tracked me down here. After that, I returned to live with my real mom. And guess what? I now realize just how awesome I am. I'm grateful to Harlow's parents for looking after me, but I still haven't forgiven Harlow yet. I'm trying to, as I know she's not all bad, but it's going to take some time. I also feel so blessed to have Hank by my side to help me discover my confidence and value my own worth. He even says I can be in his next film project, which I'm really excited about. It's good to know that I'm actually real, and I exist outside of Harlow's mind. The world is mine for the taking. And who knows, maybe one day I'll end up being a professional actress. This view of the Alps is magnificent. Wow, I've never felt this free before. <sighs> huh? Hang on, are those meowing sounds that I'm hearing? I followed the sounds to the raging river nearby, and there, stuck on a rock in the middle of it, was a terrified cat. Oh no, poor baby, I've gotta help it. I quickly grabbed onto the nearby tree, then leaned out towards the rock with an opened umbrella on the other hand for the cat to jump onto. The cat hesitated for a bit before making the leap, but it's heavier than I expected. I lost my balance and tumbled into the river. I grabbed the cat just in time, but the strong current made it impossible to float. In a panic, I screamed for help, but the waves lapped over me and gulps of water filled my mouth. And just like that, I felt my surroundings darken. Ugh, what was this wet, scratchy thing rubbing on my face? I opened my eyes to see that cat sitting on me Thank goodness it was okay, but where am I? This seemed like some kind of rustic cottage house? 
Suddenly, a man walked into the room with a food tray. Who are you? Relax, I'm the one who jumped into the river to rescue you both. Turns out, he happened to pass by the river while we were swallowed by the current, and he didn't hesitate to jump in to save us, then brought us back to his home. Oh, um, thank you. For everything. Sure. Here, eat up. So, how come you and Topaz fell into the waterway? Who? Oh, you mean the cat? How come you know his name? It says it right here. See? I'm guessing this is not your cat then? I told him how I accidentally found Topaz, so its family must live around here somewhere. Hearing this, he agreed to help me find Topaz's owner the next day. He even gave me his bed for the night, then walked out saying he'd sleep on the couch. But as a guest, I couldn't let him do that, so I just grabbed the blanket and went to sit next to him. You have a cool tattoo there. Kinda looks like a mini Mars, right? Nah, it's my birthmark. The only thing my parents left me. Hans then told me that he grew up not having a clue who his parents were or why they abandoned him. At 18, he moved out of his foster home and came here to become an herbalist. <sighs> I felt so bad for him, and in a way, I could relate. Being alone is difficult, but having both mom and dad won't guarantee your happiness. I was born into a well-off family with both of my parents, but the thing was, they only got together due to an arranged marriage, and they have resented each other ever since. My house always felt so cold and empty, and I hated staying there. So, as soon as I graduated high school, I took a gap year to travel the world. Actually, Switzerland is my first stop. Gotta say, it's nice to have someone to talk to like this. I guess Hans felt the same way by this look he gave me. He seemed very touched. The next morning, we took Topaz to the town to ask around. Turned out, today was their annual festival, so a horde of people crammed along the street to celebrate and watch the parade. Hans held my hand so I didn't get lost, but somehow the crowd still pulled me away and I ended up stuck among these sweaty people. Suddenly, a hand grabbed mine and led me out of there. Whew, thank God, I couldn't breathe in there. And you know what? A super handsome, stylish guy was standing in front of me. Are you okay? That's when I noticed the tail of my shirt was ripped. Freaked out, I tried to cover it up, so he took out a silk scarf and tied it around my waist. For a second there, I froze to the spot, so amazed by his thoughtfulness. Just at that moment, my phone buzzed with a call from Hans. He told me to meet him at the fountain. Um, slight problem? I had no idea where that was. Well, lucky me, this gallant guy offered to take me there. We talked along the way, and I found out his name's Willard. He lives in a nearby town and was here for the festival. I told him I came to find the owner of the lost cat I'd found. Then, when I showed him the picture of Topaz, he couldn't hide his shock. Are you sure this is the cat you found? I nodded. He stayed silent for a while, then said, I might know its owner, but I gotta go now. Bring the cat to meet me there. Faye, it was nice meeting you. Then he bowed down to kiss the back of my hand before he left. How sweet. I watched as he disappeared into the crowd. Thanks to Topaz, I got the chance to meet him again. Uh, why are you making that funny face? I told him about my encounter with Willard and convinced him to come with me to the address on the handkerchief. He seemed skeptical at first, <sighs> but then gave in. I mean, other than this, we had no clue. It was worth a shot, right? The next day, we went to the place Willard told us. But seriously, is this right? Why were there a line of people all holding near-on identical cats to Topaz? They even had the same collar as him. What is going on? I walked over to ask an old man sitting on a bench. He told me the millionaire lady who lives here had lost her dearest cat, Topaz. People said his name was on the top of her inheritance list, and she promised to greatly reward anyone who safely returned him, so these frauds were trying to deceive the owner by bringing some Topaz look-alike here. But, Madame Primrose is no fool. Huh? Madame Primrose? The iconic designer and president of Wisteria Fashion Corp? That's right. Oh my god! I immediately dragged Hans to stand in the line. You see, my childhood dream was to become a fashion designer. And, of course, the one I admired the most was none other than Madame Primrose! Ah! One of the reasons I came to Switzerland was to find her and hopefully become her apprentice. And now look, what are the odds? Finally, it was our turn, but... 
I'm gonna have to stop you right there. All right, everyone, listen up. Madam Primrose won't accept any toe passes from now on as she's tired of your deceit. So, disperse. What? We didn't just wait half a day here for nothing. Fine, I'll find another way to get in. We then walked around the mansion and found its side gate. Then, just when we were climbing over it, a maid caught us, but she didn't make a fuss out of it. Instead, she seemed a bit flirty towards Hans. Ooh, I had an idea. There's our chance. You go and charm her. He seemed confused at first, but then got the point. Hey, I think you're really cute. Hans then <laughs> tried his best at flirting, and as soon as she swooned, I asked her to help us return Topaz to his owner. The maid hesitated at first, but when we said that we didn't need to be repaid or anything, she agreed to let us in. We quickly split up to find Madame Primrose. I wandered the maze-like hallways, then I suddenly bumped into someone. Mind your way! Wait, I don't know you! What are you doing here? I, uh, um... She's my new friend. Is there a problem? I'm sorry, young master. It was Willard. He came to rescue me again. Great to see you again, young master Willard. You live here? Why didn't you call me when you arrived? Did you bring the cat? Where is it? Give it to me right now. Willard, calm down. Topaz is safe. I just found out his owner is Madame Primrose and- I'm her grandson. Just give the cat to me now. His agitated behavior didn't seem right. I took a few steps back from him, refused to do what he said, then ran. You don't understand. Just at that moment, Hans and Madame Primrose appeared. There you are. Are you okay? He worriedly asked. But boy, all I could see right now was Madame Primrose. She approached me, held my hand, and repeatedly thanked me for risking my life to rescue Topaz. This was amazing, but... Hmm, but why did Willard just leave without saying anything? Madame Primrose invited us to stay for dinner that evening. Joining us were Willard and his mom, Agneta. Madame then told me how much Topaz meant to her. Twenty years ago, she lost her son, Mr. Alvarez, to a car accident. Then a year later, her grandson Leroy disappeared. Her grief was almost unbearable, but then she was gifted a cat, Topaz, and thanks to him, she began to heal. I tried comforting her by saying she still had Willard, her other amazing grandson with an excellent fashion sense inherited from his grandma. But to my surprise, Madame Primrose said Willard isn't her real grandson since Agneta is actually Mr. Alvarez's second wife and was a stepmom to the missing grandson, Leroy. And Willard was her son with her ex-husband. I could see Willard and his mom were feeling so uncomfortable. Willard must have felt so hurt as Madame Primrose never even thought of him as a family member. Then my train of thought was interrupted by Hans. Ugh, why didn't he just tell me to pass him the salt instead of sticking his right arm to my face like this? Suddenly, Agneta gave him a mortified look and spilled wine all over the table. Mom, are you okay? She didn't reply, but just left. I could tell it was because she saw Hans's birthmark. What could this be? Has she no manners? She must be unwell. I'll go check on her. So I followed her to the garden gazebo. That's where I heard her talking to someone on the phone. You had one simple job. Take that pampered moggy miles away. Well, guess what? It came back. I gasped in shock, and right then, a hand covered my mouth. Shh. Be quiet. Oh, but it gets worse. The stupid cat brought Leroy, the missing grandson, home. That's right. I saw that Mars birthmark with my own eyes. If Primrose finds out about this, we're done. You hear me? Wait, so Leroy, Madame Primrose's only grandchild, is actually Hans. Uh, and... His stepmom was the one who secretly gave him away in the first place. Even worse, I was hearing the shocking news with her son. Willard, get it together. Do you know anything about her plan? I knew mom was behind Topaz going missing. That's why I tried to take the cat away earlier, to keep him safe from her. But, but Leroy too? That was just heartless. What should I do now? She's my mom after all. I could see his pure and kind soul being tormented and my heart <clears throat> ached for him. I know it must be hard, but you need to tell Madame Primrose the truth and make things right. That's a way to help your mom redeem herself, okay? He stared at me with those dreamy eyes of his, and I felt my heart turn to mush. But a phone call from Hans interrupted us. He was looking for me, saying we gotta go. Right, I had to tell him the truth. 
In a cab back to Hans's cottage, I told him everything, and he just burst out laughing, saying, <laughs> I'm Leroy, the heir of a millionaire. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm serious. You were brought to the foster home exactly 19 years ago, and you both have this one-of-a-kind birthmark. Okay, so what if I'm really her grandson? I don't even know her, and I'm definitely not rich kid material. You've been lonely your entire life. This is your chance to find the family you've always wanted. Hans was speechless. It seemed I'd hit his weak spot, and he finally agreed. We asked the driver to take us back to the mansion. But no one was awake at that hour except a gardener. He led us to a library deep into the mansion, brought out tea, and told us to wait. Just a few minutes later, Hans started coughing, and his face swelled up. Oh no, he must have been allergic to something in the tea. Panicked, I screamed for help, and the gardener came back and carried Hans to the car. But then, a hand muzzled me from behind, and everything went dark. I woke up with my head pounding and unable to move. As I tried to make sense of the situation, I realized I was tied to a chair, mouth taped, surrounded by some rusty, unsanitary medical tools, and... On the other side of the room, Hans was unconscious and tied to a patient's bed. Standing next to him was Agneta and the gardener and a guy in a blouse with some kinds of tools in his hand <laughs> about to do something to Hans's birthmark. I tried to scream and struggled to break free, but I couldn't move an inch. Right at that moment, Willard barged in. Stop this. Leave right now or I'll call the cops for your unlicensed business. And mom, I already know everything, so please have some remorse. Agneta looked so ashamed of herself. Willard, everything I did, I did it for you. Please understand. You saw how that old hag Primrose treated me. I was so miserable. Then your dad offered to help me. Dad? You mean Tim? How can he be my dad? Don't be such a wimp, son. I stayed and worked here like a servant just to be close to you. We did all this so you can be the only heir. You deserve that. Now, finish it. I... I can't, Tim. Get away from my mom, you dirtbag. You never cared about me. You only moved here to manipulate her to do your dirty work. A terrible person like you will never be my dad. And I'll do it. As he was about to lay hands on Hans, suddenly there was a meowing sound and Topaz appeared, followed by Madame Primrose. Step away from my grandson. You dared to live under my roof all this time and play foul tricks on my family? Take him away. Luckily, Hans came round, and he had a tearful reunion with his grandma. They finally had the closure they deserved. Hans decided to stay in the mansion with his long-lost family. He's even planted an herbal garden there for treating and healing people, as he always wished. Madame Primrose had finally found peace, as now she had both her beloved grandson and precious cat back. She also thought that maybe she'd been too strict on Agneta, so she decided not to press any charges against her. Agneta had also apologized, but she felt too full of shame to stay and decided to move out of the mansion. Willard followed his mom and helped her start a new life. What about me? Well, I got the thing I've always dreamt of, to be Madame Primrose's apprentice. That's her gift to me for bringing both her cat and her grandson back. And right now, I'm late for a date with a very special guy. Can you guess who it is? This school is so boring. All they do is talk nonsense and do nonsense things. Worse still, I feel like I can never escape them, as some of them live in the same neighborhood as me. But you know what the most annoying thing about my life is? That's Joy, my identical twin sister. In my parents' eyes, she's perfect. That's why she's the favorite child. Her allowance is more than mine and she gets to attend an elite private school while I'm stuck at the most boring school ever. How unfair! With a sulky face, I walked into my room whining. I think having identical daughters means our parents forgot that there's actually two of us. They've never picked me up from school. Don't be absurd. They just took me to collect my dress for the school gala. <laughs> a new dress for some fancy party. How terrible for you. I don't even want to go to the party. Trust a nerd like you not to appreciate what you have. If I were you, I'd make the most of every second of that elite school of yours. And if I were you, I would just enjoy my pressure-free life. We both <sighs> sighed and stared into a void thinking about our tiring lives. Then Joy suddenly turned to me. Oh my god, Jade! 
Do you want to be me? Go to my school, have my things, and attend the gala? What a brilliant idea! Why had we never thought of it before? I'd live her fancy life and she'd live my doll one. That's perfect! Wow, this school is enormous. I tried to keep my cool as I navigated the endless hallways in search of Joy's locker. Ah, found it. I spotted a group of girls waving me over. They must be Joy's besties. Ruth, Nora, and Nell. Unlike my boring sister, they looked very glam in their branded clothes. What a power group. Wherever we went, all eyes were on us. Students handed us snacks, saved places in the cafeteria line for us, and let us sit in the front row of the basketball match. These girls were so interesting. Bet I fit in with them way more than Joy did. Talking about Joy, she somehow loved my boring old-fashioned school. I'd never heard her chat that much in my life. About how nice my friends were, how easy all the lessons were, and how cool the school bus was. Joy's friends were so much fun, and they did cool things. For instance, they always had shopping dates and bought each other expensive gifts without question. One time, Nora, the richest girl in the group, didn't hesitate in going into Kate Spade and buying the new release handbag for Ruth. I thought this was pretty awesome of Nora, but then something happened that made me question the group dynamics. Ruth told me that she liked the red velvet cupcakes at the bakery near my house, and she asked me to buy her some. I was happy to do it, but the next day, when I brought the cupcakes and told her the price, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Joy, my dear, I don't care how much they cost. That's your concern. Then she turned to Nora, showed her a picture of a cute but expensive skirt, and told her to order it for her. Hang on, had she always been thinking it was acceptable to order us around like this? I don't understand why an innocent bookworm like my sister would hang around with this cunning clique. They don't study at all. During the test, while I was still randomly circling the answer, Ruth kept on kicking my chair and urging me to let her copy my work. And as soon as the teacher turned her back on us, she even snatched my answer sheet. Huh? What's with that attitude? I took a look around and saw both Nora and Nell were also copying another girl's paper against her will. Rude! After the test, Ruth came up to me, hissing. Have you forgotten our deal? Huh? Deal? What could it be? Well, I guess I would have to put up with Ruth for as long as I was Joy, so I could return everything to her in roughly the same condition after the gala. What I really should do now is just to enjoy this elite school life, right? So, I didn't join Ruth and her minions for lunch, but bought food from this super cool vending machine instead. They even had pizza! But the machine made these weird sounds. Ugh, I think my food was stuck. So I kicked and tapped it. But it still didn't work. <laughs> you dare get into an altercation with the pizza machine? You must be starving. Oh my god. This basketball boy was the most handsome guy I'd ever seen in my life. I was too lost in his eyes to realize the dumb machine had finally delivered my lunch. This gorgeous guy then leaned towards me and my heart skipped. Oh Cupid, I wish I was the one he picked up instead of the pizza. Here you go. Right before I could react, someone snatched the tray and pushed me aside to enter between us. Thanks Hayden, wanna share lunch with me? Huh, excuse me? How could she steal both pizza and a boy from me? The boy took my pizza from her and said, Thanks, but I'd like to share this with this cute starving girl instead. I'll buy the drinks. Wait, was he asking me? Then yes, 100% yes! Leaving a furious Ruth behind us, we walked to the bench table nearby. So, he's Hayden, the captain of the basketball team. We talked so much about our favorite comic books and even played basketball for a bit before classes. That was my best lunch ever! After school, I was about to leave when Ruth stopped me. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to mingle with Hayden? He's not wealthy. We have high standards about who deserves to be around us. Duh! Huh? She sure seemed to swoon over him earlier, but now that he'd turned her down, she decided he wasn't worthy? This girl's mindset really didn't sit well with me. As soon as I arrived home, I told Joy everything. You should listen to Ruth. Hayden must be bad news. I don't care what Ruth thinks. How come you do? Is it because of this deal you have with her? <sighs> Not your business, but stay away from Hayden. I don't want to get in trouble. 
Ugh, these vague hints were agitating me. What was it about? But whatever the deal between Joy and Ruth was, I wasn't going to let it get in the way of my blossoming romance with Hayden. Today, me and Hayden had arranged to meet at lunch again to play basketball. I excitedly walked out of art class just as the girl fell and dropped her painting set around my feet. I immediately picked them up for her, when all of a sudden, a boy's hand covered mine right before someone stamped their feet on our hands. It was Ruth! It was her who tripped up the poor girl too. She did all that on purpose to hurt me, but Hayden got there just in time to save the day. What do you think you're doing? Feeling too embarrassed being caught red-handed, Ruth couldn't do anything but give me a spiteful look before leaving. I couldn't believe that Hayden did that for me. His hand was swollen, but he just kept checking if my hand was okay. How can Ruth be so horrible? Because she knows everyone's ugly secrets, and she uses them to control people. Joy, she knows your secret too, right? No. Uh, um... I'm not sure, but I don't care. No matter what that secret is, she's gone too far. Don't worry, I got your back. So will I. Oh, I'm Katie, by the way. From then on, I no longer hung out with Ruth and her minions, but I kept quiet about this to Joy as I didn't want her freaking out and making us switch back places early. The more time I spent with Hayden, the more I found myself liking him. I wanted to confess to him who I really am, but I can't. At least not yet anyway. <sighs> Katie is really nice to me too, and she introduced me to her super sweet friends. Everything was just perfect, except my grades. Well, I didn't dare to tell Joy about this either. My study was pretty bad, and it literally ruined Joy's straight A record. Meanwhile, Ruth, time after time, insisted that I was the one who had to do all her homework, research, and tests. But duh, I couldn't even finish mine. You know what I've got. Yeah? What exactly is that you have? What's all the threat about? Ruth was stunned seeing me talking back at her like that. Yep, that was it. I've had enough. After class, she waited at my locker and signaled me to follow her to the equipment room. Finally, I can know what my secret was. Ruth showed me a video on her phone of Joy sneakily checking her notes during an examination. Was she cheating? If our principal sees this, I'm sure your precious scholarship will be long gone. And what about that excellent student title of yours? So Ruth was using this to manipulate Joy. Does she do the same to everyone else? Do you think this would scare me? I don't think. I know. You don't want to lose everything, right? <laughs> no, Ruth. It's you who's gonna lose. Do whatever you want with that clip, like I care. And so, I walked away, leaving a fuming Ruth behind. To be honest, I was a bit scared. Well, I know scores and things like academic transcripts were so important to Joy. What if I destroyed it all? After my last class of the day, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. The principal called me to her office and showed me the video that proved that I cheated on a math exam. She was so disappointed in my horrible grades recently, she even asked if it was because I was too caught up in my dating life and the bad influence I called friends. But how am I supposed to tell her that it was just my own incompetence? Nothing to do with Joy or Hayden or my new friends. I just reached my room door when I heard mom scolding Joy. The principal must have called her. It was all my fault. When mom left the room, I could feel how angry and frustrated mom was. Joy, I'm so sorry. I couldn't let Ruth have this hold over me. Um, I mean you anymore. I waited for Joy to take it out on me. But to my surprise, she was kinda happy. <gasps> That's okay. I think I should thank you for that. I've never been brave enough to stand up for myself, although I was so tired of getting picked on all the time. I was so scared, but turns out being scolded by mom isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> My homeroom teacher also called me, but she only gave me a warning and told me not to make the same mistake again. I've never felt this at ease before, Jade. I'm not the perfect Joy anymore. Then, Joy told me about the pressure she felt to be perfect. One time, she even got sick before the math test due to studying too much. Not having enough decent revision and being afraid of getting a bad grade, Joy cheated and was caught and recorded by Ruth as evidence. We finally understood each other and decided to teach Ruth a lesson to stop manipulating and taking advantage of others. We spied on Ruth and secretly recorded her. 
And guess what? Turned out she was not as wealthy as she always pretended to be. All the brand names she had were from the poor victims that she called friends. I also filmed Ruth forcing the top students to do homework and essays for the rich kids while she just sat idly to collect money. I was so ready to post these videos online, but Joy stopped me. She told me if we did this, we were just as bad as Ruth. Instead, she had a better idea. She sent the videos to Ruth and demanded her to delete all of the student's secrets. In exchange, we would delete all of hers. Ruth, of course, had no choice but to obey. Wow, how mature my sister is. My last day in Joy's life has arrived. I'm just gonna make the most of it before I hand the reins back to my sister. Honestly, I kinda miss my normal school and my friends. But what about Hayden? Will he still wanna know me when he finds out I lied to him? I was looking around for Hayden when I saw some mean girls mocking Ruth for wearing a dress cheaper than theirs. So I walked straight up to them and whispered into their ears that I knew all their dirty secrets and they couldn't do anything else but storm off. Ruth gave me a coy look, mumbled a thank you, and then left. At that moment, a warm hand gently clasped mine. Hayden! Wow, you're so cool. I... I'm not that cool, Hayden. Actually, I am... I have something I have to tell you. I then told him everything, from how I swapped identities with my twin sister to how I ruined her school life because of my childishness. You didn't ruin anything. Actually, you made things much better. So, since the pizza vending machine day till now, it has always been you, not Joy, right? Yeah, it's been me all along. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Then he pulled me in for the best kiss ever.